workshop is sponsored by uh, the National Science Foundation. And here I have my uh, co-PI on the grant, Dr. Luna, is from uh, uh, the University of the University of the University in Indianapolis. So, uh, welcome everyone. Um, so, we'd like to start by um, having a Dr. Deborah Reinhardt, uh, the UCF Associate Vice President for Research and Scholarship, to give us an uh, opening welcome, welcome in our remarks. Thank you, Deborah. Good morning and welcome to UCF. Those of you that aren't from UCF, um, I'm here representing the Office of Research regrets. Um, as, as a former NSF program manager, I realized the value of these workshops to help establish research needs and direction forward. Um, and this one, which is looking at community resilience to disaster, is especially important as the results could definitely save lives and property. So um, thank you, NSF. Are there <laughs> for, uh, for doing this? But, but thank you so much for being here because I know how busy everybody is. So um, it's really great that you're here, and, um, and I wish you all the best on this, this day. It looks like a really interesting program. Um, those of you not from Florida, enjoy the sunshine. I, I was in Boston yesterday, and it was 12 degrees and really blowing. So uh, we're, we're, we're quite fortunate this kind of weather. So um, enjoy it. Um, that's all I have. <laughs> Uh, and next we have uh, uh, Dave, he's a representative the uh, Associate Dean for Research for uh, the uh, um, College of uh, Community Innovation and Education. He's here um, representing uh, the Dean of that college, Dr. Pamela C.C. Carroll. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> good morning and welcome. And uh, on behalf of Dean C.C. Carroll and the College of Community Innovation and Education, um, we'd like to welcome you to UCF. Um, the college is very excited to help uh, sponsor this NFF, NSF sponsored workshop and the opportunity to bring researchers, practitioners, and students together uh, to discuss the challenges associated with community flood risk management is very important. Um, the images I saw last night on, on TV from the uh, Russian uh, River in Sonoma County, California, uh, were all too overwhelming and uh, the extensive damage caused by the flooding the immense emergency response that, that was required. Um, whereas the, the flooding in Houston uh, from Hurricane uh, Harvey has become a key case study in, in your profession, citizens in many communities um, along the East Coast experienced their own version of uh, a flood disaster this past September from Hurricane um, Florence. And unfortunately, the, the phrase reality TV uh, takes on a new meaning. <coughs> A 500 year flood uh, is no longer on TV but at your front door and trying to um, uh, go to the second floor to the roof and your life is still in danger is, uh, brings the work you do today very important and very home to, to many citizens. Um, so clearly your, your commitment to improving um, communities' resilience to flood, um, future flood disasters is timely and of immense value. Um, I'd encourage you today to listen to presentations, engage in conversations, and plan for future research and interventions that you think about uh, and be mindful about the silent appreciation of our communities. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's much too late before we even know you're working on our behalf. And so um, it's really important to uh, help you understand how, how much your work is appreciated, even though most of us know very little about what you're, what you're doing and what the issues are. And, Thinking about the Russian River, I also was wondering what type of mental health needs are, are going to be needed in that community uh, today and in many months to come uh, to get over the kind of the emotional damage in addition to the basic assistance they need today for food and housing and then whatever rebuilding and whatever timeline that would take. Um, UCF has recently rebranded itself as America's Partnership University and the reason being is that we know that we're stronger by working together. So as you talk today, I really encourage you to think about how the university, with our many assets as well as our communities, can come together. And so 
uh, again, we have counselors that do emergency interventions, but I'm not sure we're called to uh, emergency disasters. And so is that an area that we could reach out to and engage them in, in your agenda as you think about mitigating uh, the damage from, from floods? So on behalf of the faculty, staff, and students of the College of Community Innovation and Education, I'd like to welcome you and, and wish you the best for the day. So, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dave. Uh, so the next uh, item on the agenda is the introduction of uh, speakers. Uh, but before then, I'd like to uh, kind of make a slight adjustment. Uh, one of our presenters won't be able to make it. It's actually based on the weather. So uh, Dr. Craig Landry will not be joining us today. Uh, so what we're going to do is just kind of uh, kind of move up the agenda. So we'll start with. Uh, uh, Dr. I mean, uh, Mr. Uh, this is uh, Shannon Khalid. She'll be presented first, and then um, followed by uh, Kevin Mickey. Well, his presentation will be brought up to be the second one, and then uh, we take a break and then come back and have the presentation by uh, Dr. Newman. So uh, the presenters are uh, Shannon Khalid. She's from uh, the Environmental Defense Fund. She traveled. She, where were you yesterday? In Puerto Rico. Yeah, she was Puerto Rico. So. You know, to, to have left that place and come is very important, right? So thank you for making this trip, Shannon. Um, so we have Ken Mickey from Indiana University, for the University of Indianapolis, also here. And then we have Doug Noonan. So without further ado, uh, Shannon, please, you're up next. will also help communities 
uh, address other issues as well. They can address uh, to help improve um, their resilience to climate change. It will help, um, uh, sorry, aid adaption to climate change, and it will also um, do other have other co-benefits, which I will talk about. So. Um, I guess one other point that I haven't really addressed yet on the slide is the point that I am not suggesting that natural infrastructure is the sole solution. I'm, I'm positing that natural infrastructure fits into a larger suite of solutions that needs to be included to underutilize a tactic. And then the rose. The rose is here to remind me to talk to the fact that you may have heard some other terms about uh, that include natural infrastructure or may sound the same to you. So those terms, I am all including under the rubric of natural infrastructure. Things like green infrastructure, which has been branded largely by the Environmental Protection Agency for addressing storm and water runoff and water quality and timing issues, um, typically for small events. Ecosystem-based disaster risk reduction, international term uh, of which this is a portion of. Um, living shorelines, a technique that's been used in our coasts uh, and uh, some estuarine areas. The core of engineers term, nature and nature-based features, or NNBF. Now there's a mouthful. Just roll those right off if you right off your tongue. Green shores is another term that's been used. So all of these today I am including in the rubric of natural infrastructure. These are grows by any other name that smell just as sweet. You didn't know I was going to do Shakespeare, did you? So interest in natural infrastructure has been rapidly expanding. Um, this, just a quick you know, Google search on the terms natural infrastructure, storm, flood risk reduction, um, uh, basically popped this up. Uh, so I'm going to say that what, what I want to do is make that uh, exponential growth even faster, higher, and continuing. So why is there this interest in natural infrastructure? Oh, you're locked out. You don't want to hear this part. Uh, so natural infrastructure, as I said, can reduce the, the conditions that intensify floods. You can slow water movement. You can increase soil permeability. You can capture water where it lands. You can also direct where water flows so that it has less harm. And there are a whole host of different nature-based um, activities that are methods that now are being implemented. And that's what I've pictured here. Uh, you know, everything from planting cover crops to roughening the surface to putting more curves into um, uh, tributaries or even gullies. Um, this uh, picture right here, sorry, I should probably put it this little one. They use quote unquote leaky dams. Uh, they can sometimes put sticks parallel in gullies. Uh, and they call it gully stuffing. I love that term. Um, we have baller placement, normally used for traffic control, keeping cars out of uh, and you hear bollards, but we're putting them in streams uh, in the northwest uh, in order to help the energy move in a different place. But they're putting them in in wood and whatnot so that they can slowly erode and the stream has changed um, you know, direction the energy is going elsewhere. And of course, you know, restoring storage areas, which is a long-used uh, floodplain management technique. And green infrastructure pictured there on the far bottom, reducing and um, slowly curving runoff. So in the coastal zone, you see there's a there's also been expanding interest, and a lot of that is because obviously the coastal zone has a whole lot of risk associated with climate change, sea level rise. So natural infrastructure not only can reduce flood risks, uh, it can help with erosion, pre preventing or slowing erosion, and uh, can even help the communities uh, that implement to cope with rising seas and give them some time to figure out how they're going to go. So examples of different coastal infrastructure, we just sort of go around from the uh, clockwise. So a reef, uh, uh, this is oyster reef, you have coral reefs, you have oyster reefs, and other shellfish reefs. Beaches, wide beaches, vegetated dunes, the wider the better. Growing wetlands and improving wetlands. It's a picture of Louisiana where a wetland is growing. And um, mangroves, which are the superheroes uh, of natural infrastructure because they do so much. So as I mentioned, we do 
reduce erosion, they can slow inland transfer of water, <coughs> excuse me, store surface water just like floodplains and riparian systems, but they also can reduce wave force and height, so that which is where a lot of the coastal damage is actually uh, from. And some block debris, wetlands and, and mangroves in particular, and they all buffer well, the laminated face once these buffer communities. And I would even argue that um, reefs can buffer communities by the way. So, natural infrastructure, I'm saying, is basically should be an important and, in fact, an explicit dimension of flood damage reduction. Underutilizing is time to scale it up. But why? Well, first of all, I would argue that historically, uh, our processes for flood risk reduction have proven pretty ineffective and inadequate. The cost of floods uh, is rising, the impact is rising, and I suspect that everybody in this room knows that from 2015 to 2018, we had eight billion dollar flooding disasters in this nation, totaling a, co a cost collectively of 25 billion dollars. That's not counting all of the small disasters. So we obviously, I guess for me, it's obvious that we need additional measures to supplement traditional approaches of flood damage risk reduction. We need to diversify our tool set uh, to better address hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. And natural infrastructure can do all that and, reduce, and help improve our environmental conditions as well. So, we're not doing a great job now, and I don't mean to say that in a way that belittles the important work that everybody in this room does. But there is a lot more that could be done, okay? So, the problem is, is that our risks of damaging floods are going up. So this graph is from uh, a study in the Gulf of uh, Mexico and U.S. Uh, states and demonstrates how clearly that you know, multiple factors are adding into this increased risk, but climate change is a big one. And I suspect you could probably develop the same graph for riparian systems. So we need system redundancy. We need multiple lines of defense that help us. Strategies that hold water on the land and manage water more effectively. Furthermore, if we were to rely solely on the traditional st structural measures, seawalls and levees, we're also threatening the beneficial functions and values of these natural infrastructures that are in our riparian areas and in our uh, coastal floodplains. We do that, we're actually increasing our flood risk and flood damages. So the other reason is, it's actually turning out, uh, the few studies that have been done, cost effectiveness is demonstrating <coughs> that they can be, uh, natural infrastructure can be as cost effective, if not more cost effective, than structural measures. Now, again, a lot of this depends on place, scale, and whatnot. Um, but there is that opportunity, and so that's another reason why it deserves to be taken uh, into consideration. But perhaps the most compelling reason uh, certainly at the community level, and because this is where natural infrastructure gets really, really attractive, there are all these other co-benefits. So the advantages of restoring natural infrastructure functions include creating recreational space, improving water quality, fish and wildlife habitat. So natural infrastructure provides a community asset even, every day, even when there isn't a storm. So that makes it very attractive to building community support for those actions. And, it, you know, and if these things are seen as community assets, people start to understand that. They understand that it's improving property values, that it's bringing in eco tourism dollars, that it can be even a source of fish and wildlife uh, for sustenance purposes. Okay, so here we are back to where we started. So let's take a look at the third, the purple box here. You know, what are the policies and practices that could scale up natural infrastructure? Okay, so first, communities can better articulate, let me say the other way around, communities can articulate better paradigms that can build a clear vision of what it's going to take to address flood damages. Because it isn't just one solution, it's the responsibility of many different people, parties from homeowners and businesses to different levels of government, all out to the federal system. Okay? So several new models actually exist, and I'm sure more are going to be developed. But the new models that I have listed here have you know, certain things in common. So they're looking at sort of spatially, where does, where does you know, again I said before, holding more water where it lands, but they also look at modifying the event, which is something we 
got it always done from an engineering perspective. But they're looking at it sometimes with increasing channel capacity and increasing the capacity of the floodplain to function as a floodplain. And they're also looking at modifying the vulnerability of people moving humans and infrastructure out of high hazard areas. So these spatial approaches really work well in an opening up sort of the aperture to think about the natural infrastructure and how it fits in. Okay, second one. Communities need to be able to assess all of the environmental and socioeconomic systems that influence flooding and flood damaging, and flood damages. So this diagram is just a partial sort of quick analysis of what goes into systems thinking. And I don't know if how many of you have like ever done or seen an iceberg analysis. This is mimicking that, okay? So when communities start to look at the underlying, the systems and the under, they start to figure out the underlying causes, the root causes of flooding. What are all the different sources? They start to figure out the hidden facets, right? Um, to, in order to create new solutions. They also can start to understand what are the misperceptions or the mythologies and then start to debunk those mythologies. Or what are the questions? Because sometimes those myths and mythologies are based on fact. Well, what is it? What is happening? That, that's just so, so important. And when you start to think about these things in systems, then you understand how they interact together. And how do building codes fit into, you know, and land use management on the farms, and the building codes, and uh, the culvert sizes, and all these, how does it all fit together? And then if people understand how the whole system is to play together, then you have a better chance of developing solutions that will work, that won't have unintended consequences, and that can be sustainable. And perhaps I would even argue a better able to win broader support. So systems thinking helps us to think about problems at the right scale, you know, to, to help ascertain what portion of the flooding comes locally and what comes from outside of a jurisdiction, for example. And using spatial and temporal data is especially effective in looking at things like, well, how has land use changed? What's the change in flood frequency? And help folks figure out what's the risk and where, you know, what damage is actually acceptable? And where will nuisance flooding become a bigger problem in the future? But I think one of the other really unspoken heroes, uh, reasons behind that spatial data and trend analysis is that it helps create a really important story. That narrative is critical for getting both citizens and decision makers on board with new ideas and understanding the complexity of the problem. So systems analysis and data and trend, spatial data trend analysis really are important to helping identify those geographic boxes around which government systems need to exist don't exist, they need to be created. So good governance starts with leadership, and developing that clear vision of what it is going to take to, to implement and sustain actions that reduce flooding. Phil Burke's work, it, um, he has shown that effective implementation really means that the government structures are aligned. All the agencies make decisions that are enforced, that are risk informed, and reinforce each other so that they're not undercutting real community risk-informed decision-making. Because too often, we have folks that are doing emergency management and floodplain management, natural resources management, and economic development. They're not talking to each other, and they're coming up with conflicting plans. So you got to line up your ducks. That's why the duck picture was there. So another government practice is choosing to commit to the idea of adaptive management. Given a desire to you know, build flood resilience, reduce flood risks, got to admit there are uncertainties regarding the evolving flood risks that communities are facing, primarily due to climate change. And frankly, there is a shorter track record with natural infrastructure. You know, we don't have this long experience about what it does. So it makes an awful lot of sense. If you want to be able to move a project forward quickly, because we are under pressure to do more, better, faster, then we need to think about adaptive management as a way to get those projects moving forward and then adapting to what we learn as we learn. 
That's really hard for urban agencies. Okay, so also in the vein of governance, adaptive management, but maybe with a little bit more of a technical twist, is it understanding the, you know, there's still a lot of work to do to understand the, the engineering uh, limitations, the design considerations, the, the, the limits of performance of natural infrastructure. But we also need more information, it's cost effectiveness, you know, how much does it cost to maintain, you know, all these kinds of things. How, and how resilient is natural infrastructure in an engineering perspective? What happens if there's two storms in a row, or three storms in a row? How is it going to perform? So I would argue that rather than a haphazard sharing of, you know, successes and failures, that we need to get far more systematic if we want to accelerate adoption of natural infrastructure solutions. And that means that every project has to have budgeted into it monitoring, right? How did it perform? And what was, you know, what went into it? Um, everything that would be relevant to an engineer, an economist, and a decision maker needs to be documented before the project, during the project, after the project. Okay? Because then folks can make better decisions. And then lastly, it's not just documenting it, but sharing it getting it into databases out there so that the next community can learn from it. And there are actually some clearing houses of data on living shorelines now, but there's many of them. How many places are we all going to pick to clear a project, right? So we need to get a little better at that. Okay, another item. We need to build more community capacity to assess and make better informed decisions. And nowhere is this more true than for the smaller, under-resourced communities. And those communities pepper the coastal and riparian floodplains of this nation. Um, you know, it is not the really large cities. They've got GIS up the wazoo, and they have the ability to bring in experts. But if you go to uh, Kingstown, uh, North Carolina, where I was two weeks ago, they don't have anything like that. And they need it because they flood it. So one way, so I've been thinking about, you know, how do we build capacity uh, as an environmental NGO, which I represent, and one of the things that we're looking at is, you know, how can remote sensing combined with machine learning actually help speed information at low cost to some of these kinds of communities? So we think that there's a lot of promise to this, so we actually, um, I've put together a grant um, with some academic and other professional organizations to get um, the National Academy of Sciences to fund this kind of work, looking at well, what are the shifts of land use, habitat loss, can we figure out tipping points for flood intensifying conditions. So cross your fingers for me, I think we'll have something new to say about this in a couple of years. The Internet of Things. So, there are all sorts of new opportunities to integrate hyper-local, real-time information on precipitation, soil moisture, uh, retention ponds, you know, that litter the landscape now because we have these requirements of low-impact design. And you could integrate how natural infrastructure functions as well. And then you could actually create these more effective localized systems of flood management and reduce damages. Sort of a SCADA system, but at a small scale. Okay, let me turn to the last two points, which are about money. Because we need money to pay for these projects, right? I mean, isn't this always the dilemma? Despite the fact that we know that, um, you know, it makes far more economic sense to do hazard mitigation before a disaster than after, you know, about five to six times uh, more economically efficient. And yet that argument never seems to get any traction with state government, with Congress. I mean, okay, there's more money going into it, but not enough. So we need to we need to find other sources of money. So the Environmental Defense Fund, we've been exploring these kinds of mechanisms. And um, one of them was us we looked at was an environmental impact bond. We released a study just last summer where we looked at this performance-based financing mechanism. And we said, will it work in Louisiana to help restore wetlands there? And we found that, in fact, it would speed implementation. It would reduce the cost to the state for doing these wetland restoration projects. And it had a good potential for attracting private investment involvement in the transaction. Well, that's a win-win-win. 
So we need to start trying these mechanisms. Um, environmental impact bonds have been used for stormwater management. The second one was just announced last week for Atlanta. The first one was Washington, D.C. So another aspect is by documenting the flood risk reduction benefits and cost savings with the performance-based agreements could open up this whole new world, at least in theory, that you know where you can start to have a good conversation. For example, an upstream community can then um, be paid by a downstream community. If you know what their measures of there would reduce your flood, and you'd be willing to pay for it. It's a way to potentially pay farmers and uh, foresters different, you know, for different land management practices. Um, so it's, it's sort of an exciting new way. But we can only do this if we can share the models. So here's back to that sort of information sharing. So there's a group that I'm involved with called the CPIC. Let's see if I can remember what it stands for. The Coalition for Private Investment and Conservation. So we're developing blueprints for the different models that have, financial models that have been tried with the idea that it's a clearinghouse of sorts and people can go in and say, well, that one could work for my situation. So we need some more of that. Okay, so where flood risk reduction benefits of restoring natural infrastructure can be documented, that means that there's a way to resist the services provided by the natural infrastructure. So that means that the community rating system. Communities potential, they can document the benefits they get from natural infrastructure, then they should be able to get better ratings under the community rating system. Or I'm going to change the community rating system. One of the two. So they can do it. Um, and what that does, if, I think all of you probably here know, that reduces the um, insurance premiums for um, the residents of that community. Another way is the communities to plan and implement actions that reduce the impact of storms and climate change could benefit in another maybe more subtle but important financial means, and that's their, their bond rating. Moody's put out a report uh, back in November 2017 that basically said that creditworthiness and climate adaptation, you know, they're linked uh, in terms of you know, if you have high needs to respond to emergencies and rebuild and things like that, that's going to hurt your credit or you know, your credit rating, basically. And they have to make quite clear that they already do consider climate change and adaptation measures um, in their analysis, and they're going to continue to do so, and they're going to get more rigorous about it. So by including natural infrastructure, you both lower the vulnerability of flood hazard in the community, but the community also, because it's better able to recover from the climate shocks, they are better able to maintain a secure or secure a good rate. So let me conclude with along the nation's seaboards and rivers, land use changes, disappearance of features like wetlands and salt marshes and open floodplains, barrier islands, you know, reefs. You know, it's all increased. Uh, it's increased our flood risk, you know, by intensifying flood conditions, exposing communities to more hazards. Uh, riparian floods, storm surge, uh, hurricanes, excuse me, storm waves, and tidal flooding. So by undertaking a comprehensive analysis of flooding problems, by we can better understand what the potential solutions are, we can see where natural infrastructure potentially fits in, we improve both water and land management, we lessen the conditions to intens that intensify floods, we reduce the exposure. And as we build our capacity to document the performance of all these um, activities, we create new means to finance and implement the solutions. So it's all related. And I'll stop there. Hopefully not over my time. And so if you get, if you have no questions, we can play a game of match the analogy to the natural infrastructure. <laughs> but I think you'd rather ask questions. And I don't know, I think you can first. Do we have, do you have time for questions now, or what do you want to do? Yes, yes, okay. if you have questions now. Thank you. Sorry, I was just pointing out. <laughs> That's very important. All right, anybody, questions? I struck them down. Oh, we did? That's not good. All right, one question. So 
Mike can kind of tell us your name and where you represent it and your organization. Okay. Uh, I'm Lulu Oberon for the environmental. So uh, for my solo presentation, talking about machine learning and the sensor and the funding, I think the most funding you're talking about was kind of post-development. So I was thinking, is it possible they provide the pre-development that when they propose the pump treatment, when they propose the LID to the uh, nation, um, to the treatment of the water, uh, we can provide funding to encourage the client or the resident to say they install the sensor and then they provide the documentation for you. You give them some funding, then uh, you have more data for your research and then they can share to the other person. Instead of when all this infrastructure was installed, then you want to put the sensor back, you need a more funding for your research. I was thinking, uh, do you have that kind of funding? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure I completely understand your question, but I guess let me say that what I'm trying to suggest is that both there is a need for more investment up front to avoid the damage, and that if you document what the damages were that are going to be avoided, you can find other sources or people or institutions that are willing to help pay it's almost like an insurance, right? I mean, it's a form of insurance. Like, okay, you do that, then I won't have to do this, you know, vegetation removal or some, you know, uh, I won't, my, my infrastructure won't be damaged, things like that. Does that, does that add to what you're, or am I missing your point? It kind of, as I was thinking about before they build everything, can they apply the cost from like a NSF or the state or local government? Before, before they build. Yeah, yeah, before they build. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the more you have data that proves the concept that it will have flood reduction benefits, the easier it is to apply and make that argument. So that's why it's important to gather that information so that and share it, you know, in a systematic way so that more people know that it's out there. So I would encourage that there needs to be a lot more research and publication on those performance benefits. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Thank you. Hey, my name is Thomas Wald. I'm here at UCF in the Sustainable Coastal Systems Cluster and National Center for Integrated Coastal Research. It's still a mouthful. <laughs> um, my question is for international collaboration, how much you try to learn. I'm from Europe originally, but I, I might be wrong, but my feeling is that they have done that a little bit longer. Yep. Than in this country, especially the Dutch, obviously, but also Germany, mm -hmm. where they've seen projects in that direction. Is that is there like a, a network or something official that allows you to to bring in that information and maybe accelerate the process right. of implementing this into guidance documents? I am not aware of something systematic or formal, um, but. The, I am involved in an international effort led by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, for example, to develop guidance on the design of natural infrastructure projects, so planning and design. And uh, that has folks uh, from the Netherlands, England, Italy. Um, the EU is more advanced because they actually have a directive that talks to um, natural infrastructure in the broad uh, all the different uses. Um, so I do think Europe is advanced. And the Dutch, because they have been um, taking their uh, eco shape, which is one of their branded uh, efforts, but you know, because of their success in the Room for the River, for example, and because of eco shape, which is using natural infrastructure um, solutions, they've done that internationally in Vietnam, I think in India. So I think, yeah, that there's a lot to be learned, and that's why we need to gather some. Any other questions? I have a question as it relates to, because uh, we're talking about beneficial function, and currently within our region, the state of Florida, how they are using mitigation credits for impaired wetlands, moving them, but they're also changing the floodplain and the beneficial function of the area. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a whole 
host of issues that due to water management districts and other things that they're altering the floodplains. Uh, and some of the use permits, I mean, it doesn't look like there's, because we're talking micro and macro, a regional approach, an area approach. Everyone's impacting, uh, you know, the floodplain through no use of each one's interaction. Yeah. I know we try to do that through the Army Corps of Engineers, through the water management districts, but they're putting in policy that is impairing areas that are not considered by other agencies. So I, mean, I think there's, as we look at spatial analysis from a basin going up, that there's a number of factors that everyone needs to get you know, involved in that I see it just continues to appear. And it's so frustrating. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, because you sit there and it's like, look, people, this isn't rocket science. We actually know how to cope better with floods, but we keep doing things that make it worse for ourselves because one agency only looks at their narrow responsibility. I only approved wetland permits, and did they mitigate it for habitat reasons and water quality? Yes, okay, fine. Uh, and so that's where I think we do need you know, far more integrated decision making and you know some alignment where everyone says yes it is my responsibility to look at what the effect of this action is whatever it is they're permitting you know is it permitting a, an action of floodplain or is it permitting you know the design of a building and you know start to make risk informed decisions and we have to take a you know longer view because um, the conditions around that exist now, in 20 years, when that building or that feature is there, are going to be different. And so, you know, I mean, if we could, so we, that's where we have to have that leadership and governance that says, no, I'm going to hold you guys accountable. You can't do the, it's just, this isn't my job. Yes, it is your job. We all have to make this our job. Because it's that important of an existential threat to our nation's economy, our national well, one point I want to add to that, to where you're talking about historical significance, it seems as least, at least with our agency and with the city of Orlando, um, there's a lot of, uh, not a much, as much value put into historical information. I try to preserve as much as I can because we have pre-existing conditions, even though floodplains have been altered, but we still know where our natural uh, conveyance systems are and you know, what areas can provide a beneficial function at a time, but as soon as they get new data in, it seems like they're just, you know, getting out of, you know, rid of the old data. Um, you know, it, it, there's a historical significance to what the floodplain has done and how it's been altered and how to recreate that floodplain. That's a fantastic point, and when I talk about trend analysis, I should have made a greater emphasis that it's backcasting, or not backcasting, but historic trends. Um, I saw, this may sound irrelevant, but it's not. This, the, so researchers, um, I don't remember what university it is, it's just terrible. Um, but for Baltimore, just developed a three-dimensional map of historical Baltimore. And when I looked at that, that's exactly where my brain went with this kind of 3D thing that then shows the shift in land use. And if you overlay then the flood risks, you would really start to have an aha moment and say, oh yeah, maybe those practices of sprawl and whatnot aren't so good. So there's another research area. 3D mapping and historical trend analysis, getting back to what it used to be and what happened then. All right, thank you. I'll be around all day. Feel free to grab me a break. Anybody else? I have a few more. Sorry, Mr. Howard, I'm done with you. Oh, you're not done with me. Sorry. Oh, it's done. Well, so you inspired me. Uh, almost offhand comment, but it reminded me of much. So I started off the, my career as an environmental economist. We had the joy of teaching students about cap and trade and clean air act and how we had nice permits on issue. And in our telling of the history of this, the EDF plays a big role in supporting a really innovative policy to deal with externalities where people were making decisions trying to get them to internalize that. And then you mentioned sort of upstream, downstream communities in this context, and this idea of having sort of downstream communities paying upstream communities for reducing their negative externalities and things like this. So it, it was neat to hear, but 
it was a big policy change and not a small bit of legality to establish essentially property rights over something and give a baseline and then implement. And I'm wondering about your thoughts about the practical implications of that. I mean, the units trading here aren't polluting firms necessarily. We're talking about government to government, jurisdiction to jurisdiction, just for trading or transfers. With experience of that, but the property rights and legal system is different. So I'm curious to think, what you might think that would play out in practice. And then, because there's a bunch of other questions in here, you also then start talking about essentially agency to agency spillovers, yeah. where one agency isn't paying attention to another. And there's a more of a mind-blowing thing, thought, I think, to think about having one agency compensating another one for doing something that isn't what its natural in inclination is. So it's not jurisdiction to jurisdiction geographically, right? but it's something else. So right. somewhere in there, there's a question, and I guess the question is, would you like to comment? Oh my god, you gave me like, if you'd said it slower, there were about five things I wanted to comment on. Um, <laughs> so, you know, um, EDF is all about trying to figure out, uh, it's all about trying, EDF is all about trying to figure out market-based mechanisms. Um, and, you know, there are examples, I think I mentioned South Florida Water Management District has paid, uh, uh, farmers for you know, shifting some of their water use and their practices to uh, to improve water quality as well as timing of uh, water flows. And there's an example I just heard about in California, but I can find it for this. Um, so I think that when you start to have willing buyers and sellers and trading, that, that where there isn't a system, a system will be created. It will happen because people want that exchange. And you know, places like farmers, you know, a lot of farmers are struggling because they have too much water. But here's a way that water can keep their crop. So, um, you know, I think I think some of those things will come. Now, there was like six other things, um, and one of them was uh, that we had talked about having a summer intern and start to look at some of that information. I can't remember which point you raised. It's terrible. Um, so I can't think of anything else articulate to say because those were all really good points. Um, I think that, you know, how do you get the the Army Corps of Engineers or a, for example, I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna go to Houston. Houston, you, talk, you go down there, I mean, they're um, talking about natural infrastructure and financing issues. Their flood control district guy still goes out and says like that his, his the reason he does this is to develop land, for land to be able to be developed. And I'm going to argue that no, that's not the function of the floodplain or the flood management district. <laughs> um, you know, so there's that's where some of this alignment has to happen, and that's where someone who has a leadership role, either a mayor or a county council or a state leader, has to say, no more. You know, this is what you're responsible for. You're keeping people safe. Not creating new land for development. All right. Last one? And that's hard to do because those guys pay into their campaign, those developers. So I'm not trying to be naive here. Um, but sometimes people have to sort of rise up and raise some of these issues. Okay. I think we have uh, I think we have to like okay. set a buy it here. I mean, <laughs> All right, last one. Okay. Hi, I'm Dante Jones, I'm a PhD candidate at Open University. Uh, so my question uh, is, it's a very minute aspect of your presentation. Could you talk a little bit about the usage of the term natural infrastructure and the rhetoric surrounded by it? And so I'm, I'm so used to hearing green infrastructure, but I think you mentioned that it's not always well received, so I'm just trying to understand a little bit of the background and transition terminology. All right. So green infrastructure, um, from my perspective, and I, I could be wrong, uh, was really branded and marketed by EPA as uh, a way to, and, and was embraced by stormwater district managers all over the country because it's cheaper to do things to hold water and to treat it than to build whole new pipelines. And because EPA had, you know, a new, um, uh, well, I can't remember what it was, 4144. Uh, but a new requirement on the water quality, right, coming out of the, the um, runoff. So they had sort of a 
regulatory treasure and they have this um, potential solution that will have people grabbed onto and said, oh, wow, this is great. So an EPA has been working on that for 10 years or more. So anything that's EPA, and they call it green, becomes, oh, that's environmental. And um, we have a lot, and, and frankly, environmental issues have become more polarized in Congress, where it used to be, in, you know, conservation was a Republican Party ethic, and, uh, constant, you know, environment was, I mean, it just wasn't polarizing. Well, it's become that way. And frankly, I would rather it not be polarized because I think it's, it's the how you get to something, not the what you're doing, is, is really what we should be focusing on. And we can have disagreements on the how. Um, so green infrastructure, um, I was talking to a, a Democrat and Republican committee uh, staff and they just didn't want to call it green because there is a gut reaction that says, oh, green, that's democratic, or green, that's environmental, and it, we don't want that to be the perception. We want it to be about this is a solution. So that's why the shift to natural. Um, the Corps of Engineers very strategically called it nature and nature-based uh, features because they needed to sell it to the engineering community, basically, that it can work engineering way that it didn't have green in it. So it's, it's sort of sad, but you know, some folks have called us where they have green shores. I think green shores is used more in the Pacific Northwest. Well, politically there, green is good. And I think Europe, I think Europe uses green infrastructure, but uses it to be everything. So for a long time, we were fussing over the term and what to call it, and I just kept saying, you know, natural infrastructure, because at the time we had infrastructure bills, and so actually getting people to think about this as part of the basic components around which we need to survive, which is infrastructure. So, that's my branding. <laughs> okay. All right, let's uh, give a... Uh... <laughs> I, I'm just curious, are you seeing that terminology showing up in the literature yet? Which one? Natural? Natural. That, that graph I created was uh, included both green and uh, natural. And yes, natural infrastructure shows up a lot in the literature. Okay. But I'm, I'm open to other suggestions. Uh, anybody has a cool marketing term that would work better or work for your organization? <laughs> okay. no. Um, so, yes, I am going to walk right up to you to see if you're doing email. <laughs> um, let me start at giving you a brief introduction of my background. My name is Kevin Mayne. I am, I have one of those titles that means very little about what I actually do. How many in the room can say that? Yeah, I, when I ask people to introduce themselves, I always ask them to start with what you do for a living. And, oh, by the way, let us know what your title is because 20% of the time that's what it means. So my title is Director of Geospatial Technologies and Professional Development. What the heck does that mean? I work for an applied research center at Indiana University in Indianapolis, um, same campus that Doug and colleague works on. Um, and we have, I've been very fortunate to be affiliated with that organization. Uh, I'm the longest tenured member aside from our director. I'm coming up on 30 years, which is amazing, uh, crazy. Same duration of time I've been married, so I'm celebrating two anniversaries this year. One I have to remember, the other much less so. Um, <laughs> I want to keep reminding me. But, um, what I do for a living, for real, part of what I do actually, I'm an adjunct uh, faculty member at uh, School of Public and Environmental Affairs, where I teach uh, geospatial courses on using GIS for public safety and emergency management. Most of my time, though, I spend doing research and or teaching. So what I have on the research side, the kinds of projects, you're going to hear about a few of them uh, that I'm currently or most recently involved in. Um, things like, for example, I've been working with the state of Georgia since 2011, uh, helping them develop processes for mitigation planning. 
helping them develop tools to pull information together from local resources like property assessment data to describe the physical environment, the building environment, and to run models. Um, how many of you have heard of assets in nature? Some of you have been here. I'm a national expert on that. For years, I wrote the curriculum for FEMA and still serve as a lead instructor at the National Emergency Training Center for that. But that's only one of the tools that I use. Um, I also have been extremely privileged, and I had no idea this was going to be relevant when I took it on, to be affiliated with an organization called the National Institute of Building Sciences. Who's heard of that? Surprised any hands went up. Um, you have all heard of their work. How many of you have heard a magic number that says for every dollar you spend on hazard mitigation, on average, you say you save how much? Six dollars. That's the new number. And the reason I know that is because I was one of the lead researchers on that project. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in just a minute because it kind of connects to what I'm going to be talking dominantly about today. Uh, I had the privilege of chairing the Multi-Hazard Mitigation Council which is one of 14 councils under the National Institute of Building Sciences. For those of you that have never heard of it, a little bit of background on that, it was created in 1974 by the U.S. Congress to serve as the bridge between the building industry, emergency managers, and so forth, and Congress. It does that very effectively. Six members of its board are still appointed and ratified by the U.S. Senate, so it's, it's a great place to be affiliated with. Now, I'm a mitigation, emergency management guy. So initially when I got involved in it, I'm thinking, what the heck am I going to worry about these folks that are all about buildings, you know, worried about HVAC systems, worried about building codes and things along those lines. Because normally when I do mitigation planning and when I see that being done, those people aren't in the room. It's very rare when the building officials are in the room as part of a mitigation plan. By the way, that's a really bad decision. Because the reality is they're building the environment that we're having to mitigate and respond to. So there needs to be a collaboration. The other irony is the very number that most of us in the mitigation world have been using since 2005 came from that council. And a product a report called Mitigation Saves. That was initially released in 2005. I'll tell you a little bit about, uh, more about that when it has to do with this presentation in a minute. So I'm doing currently work on uh, the impacts of and I'm going to use the term natural infrastructure. Up till now, I've been calling it green, and I'll still use that terminology, you know. But I like Shannon's argument on that. I think it makes some sense. How many of you like natural infrastructure versus green? Yeah, I think there's something to be said for this. So it's, this alone has been worth a trip for me. We'll have some follow up conversations, I'm sure. Um, but the project I'm doing right now is looking at the impacts of that type of infrastructure. Uh, through modeling 70 plus different scenarios along the Georgia coastline. Doing work on uh, social indexes, doing work on systems developments, uh, lots of tool development, and a number of other things. But I want to talk to you today about a couple of specific activities I'm involved in. Uh, this project that I'm uh, going to be addressing specifically is actually a collaboration between a good friend and longtime colleague of mine. Uh, Dr. Shane Hubbard. He's with the University of Wisconsin Space Science and Engineering Center. Uh, he started out at the, University, or at the State of Wisconsin Emergency Management Agency and I came to work for me and then his priorities got all screwed up and decided to follow his wife instead of staying with me when she went <laughs> out to uh, work in the state of Iowa. So he went out there, got his doctorate, and ended up in Wisconsin. We worked today more together than we ever had in the past, so it's worked out for all of us. Uh, Shane and I do a lot of collaborative work together. This research I'm going to talk to you about today is part of that. Unfortunately, he's not able to be here today. Uh, like some of our presenters, uh, family issues you know, always come first, as they should. So I mentioned this uh, uh, report a couple of minutes ago. And I'm just setting a little bit of background. And I think, you know, we've already heard some of that. Hopefully, what I'm going to say, if you met him, this is a thing you should know already, hopefully. Uh, so in 2005, the mitigation safe study that was done identified a four to one return on investment. And I got to just throw it in here real quick. That number is often quoted and almost always incorrectly referenced. And the reason I say it was almost incorrectly, or almost, uh, almost frequently incorrectly referenced is because people use the number four to one and it was never four to one. Four to one is the average across all hazards. 
flood was five to one in 2005. Okay? And the different hazards that were examined, earthquake and hurricane, were, were different even than that. 2017 came along. Uh, I happened to be the chair of the council at that time. And because of work I do in flood specifically, I was asked to be one of two lead investigators on the riverine flood part of the hazard analysis. So I can speak to that in detail, but that's not what this presentation is about. So if you've got questions about it later, feel free to ask. This is what that new study shows. So somebody in the back row said 61, and you're absolutely right. There were two things that that study looked at. One was the original question asked by the 2005 study, which was, what is the effectiveness of federal mitigation grants? Mm -hmm. In 2005, that only examined FEMA grants. In 2017, we looked across multiple federal agencies, HUD, SBA, FEMA, and so forth. Okay? So that alone made it different. The new number for federal grant effectiveness, looking at a sample of lots of different grants over the years, uh, was six to one. Another really important part of the though that we did not do in 2005 but did in 2017 is we looked at the effectiveness of building beyond code. So what's the purpose of the building code? Set minimum standards. <coughs> minimum standards. Are building codes designed to save the property? No. Building codes are dominantly designed to save life. So if you're interested, and most many people don't know that, so if you're interested in actually mitigating the property as well as saving life, you also have to think about the value of building beyond minimum code. So building codes are phenomenally important. I'm a big fan, but they're a beginning, not an end. So we looked at the effectiveness of building beyond code, and we also considered the fact that there's a point at which the return on investment declines. You can build a building a thousand feet off the ground with the first row elevation, and you're going to save any flood that's probably going to happen in a lot that aren't, but you're going to spend a lot of wasted money doing it. So what's the point of diminishing return? And we looked at that as well. Now we're here to talk about floods, right? There's other parts of the hazard or the analysis that, that were done in this study, including wildland fire, by the way, which is relevant to the state of Florida. So for those of you that might be interested in that, you need to check that study out. That was a new aspect of the Mitigation Studies 2017. But we are going to talk about flood, and, and the study results in flood was 7 to 1. It was 5 to 1 in uh, 2005, and that number we increased, and I'll tell you why in just a second. And uh, hurricane surge was looked at, but there were just too few grants to explore it but, uh, to really get a good federally funded uh, estimation. For building beyond code, those are impressive numbers to me. So the value of looking beyond code, building more than you have to do at a minimum, that was what we tried to talk about. Now, at the end of the presentation, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes addressing a really important question. And I want to just give you some food for thought. It is fine to tell people that it would be a smart thing to do something to make their community safer. But if being smart, because we knew mitigation was effective, if that was all it took, tell me why we still have a growing volume of losses. Look at the federal losses. Get on FEMA's website. The dollars go up and up and up. So if simply knowing about the hazard is enough, why do we keep seeing increased losses? And that's part of the work that the council and other people are doing as well. You have to incentivize people to change behavior. It's not enough to merely know about the hazard. You have to give people to, a reason to do something different. Okay? So we'll talk more about that time remaining at the end. Now, the other thing I want to mention briefly, because this ties into the main part of the research that we did, um, this is all contextual background right now, is we looked at a number of different variables. Now, the original study looked at property loss, business interruption, and death and injuries. We quantified what those values are. You can put a dollar figure on a casualty. Okay? Social science supports that. We also looked at PTSD. 
That's a big deal. Mental health impacts, emergency response, urban search and rescue, environmental impacts, and insurance. Okay? And those elements were not considered in the 2005 study. This is one of the reasons that we see the increase in the benefit. So it's a more holistic examination of what it is that gets you value in mitigating. That is what it was about. Now, the reality is we could have done more. Time and ever permitting. There's a lot of things that weren't considered. Right? What's the impact on fringe elements of society? That's not necessarily captured in data easily. What's the impact on the culture of the community? What's the social impact? Lots of times you hear studies that say the value of the building damages X, but you destroy the social fabric of that community. And where that occurs matters. It's very difficult to take a model and apply it universally to all communities. It's not smart. Not good. Especially when you're trying to make decisions about a person. Because that person may be a different individual than somebody in a different location. Orlando is a completely different place than New Orleans and Indianapolis. Okay? So there's other things we could have looked at. Now, for the research that I'm talking about today, what Shane and I decided we wanted to do was try to understand with all of this great information, this research, and, and that mitigation study, study, by the way, was heavily peer reviewed. There were 97 people involved in one aspect or another of that project. So, I believe Shannon was one of them. So, there were lots of people at the table on this, as there should have been. Very important study. We decided to look at the question how are geospatial? By the way, is everyone in this room familiar with GIS? I'm making a really important assumption here. <laughs> okay. You know, there was not so many years ago if I asked that question. Not necessarily. Google helps, or I'm not sure which yet. Alright, so we asked the question how have web based technologies been used to inform mitigation decisions? Specifically, and there's a whole big realm that I can address, interactive map elements. Okay? We went into that study with one set of assumptions, and we are not done yet. So I'm giving you kind of an interim report, but right now our assumptions are evolving. So I'll tell you why. We are looking at two different questions. One is what best practices are emerging. Guys, there have been web-based maps out there since the early 1990s. The earliest one I found is 1993. This is not new technology. But what's different is how it's being applied. When you look at web-based GIS and emergency management, where do you see it? It's all operations. It's all recovery. Florida has phenomenal web-based technologies. Right? There's all kinds of portals and platforms and all sorts of things out there. But if you look at where mitigation is being informed by them, that's a different question. And there is a huge range. Then the second question is, what are the opportunities for informing practice through research? And that's a very big deal, because there's a lot of great research that goes on, and it never finds its way into practice. And there are reasons for that. So I'm going to quickly go through some findings, because I want to get to some stuff at the end. Help me with my time. Where did I keep going? That's all right. If I keep time here, I just go for it. Um, let me tell you about some of the things we found. Well, first of all, you know, consider that there's a reason that some of these technologies have not been as dominant as they might otherwise have been. One is absolutely access to high-speed internet. You may have great internet here, but don't count on that being true elsewhere. How many of you have had the opportunity to travel much? How many of you have been to at least 10 different states? That actually surprises me, the number's that high. So one of the reasons I'm very comfortable saying things like this is thus far I've been to 46 states and 107 cities in the US alone. And there's a huge range, and that's doing work-related stuff like this. That's not vacation time. So there's a huge range of technology. I was sitting in my hotel room in downtown Orlando last night, and the internet dropped. 
go figure. So, and this is not slanting the Lakeens, I had a good time there. But nonetheless, right, so that's not a good thing in the middle of the disaster. Right? Well, we weren't. The second element that's been a, a hindrance is the cost of developing the data resources to inform mitigation strategies. One of the things that the center I work with does in projects I lead frequently is develop these building inventories for use in hazard modeling. I've got a ton of experience doing that in lots of different states. It costs a lot and there's a lot of issues with it. Another thing that's been a bit of a hindrance is prioritizing mitigation. There have been, depending on which state you're in, mitigation is either important or a very distant cousin to doing disaster response and recovery. In many instances, the people running emergency management are from the military. And they think in terms, this is not a slight against them, it makes sense, but they think in terms of fix the problem when it happens. Don't mitigate the problem before it does. So that prioritization has very much been on response and recovery, less so on mitigation. And then there is the all-importance, and it's certainly not to be ignored, concerns about privacy and the potential of impacting things like the market value of a home by putting too much information out there. So there's the question that always comes up, how much is too much? And what's the return that you get by putting a lot of information out there? Is it justified doing that versus what you're going to lose, potentially? So let me show you some examples. Now, there's some good news. Uh, June 2017, as of June 2017, the numbers show if you go to the National Broadband website, you're going to find that most of the country now has access to at least one broadband provider, or most of it has two or more. And about three-fourths of it has examined by at least three or more providers. So we're getting there, right? Not surprising a lot of the rural communities are not as served as we'd like, but that is too is changing. Uh, there have been tremendous advancements in the development of digital flood hazard products. And by the way, that is important. Not just maps. We have had flood maps forever. Sometimes they're well used, sometimes they're incredibly misunderstood. I still cringe every time a, a hurricane comes along and you start seeing reports that say, we just had a 500 year flood. No, you haven't. Every single storm is unique. You go two city blocks in that direction, you have a 25 year flood, here it's a 500 year flood. There's no such thing, unless it's an amazing coincidence that your flood is ever going to look exactly like that map. It's a risk map, not an event map. But we still have those map products. They are digital. And that's a good thing. But the real neat stuff is things like FEMA's risk map program are developing more products that are designed to help communities understand what risk needs. There are differences in how those are being implemented around the country. There is certainly a lot more availability of at-risk information. And when I say that, what I'm talking about is models that say this is what could happen based on this scenario. There's also a lot more development of community assets. And when I say community assets, I'm talking about geospatial data sets, which identify the location of at-risk buildings, not just homes, but infrastructure, government facilities. It's not universally consistent. Another thing that makes me very happy is the fact that there is a lot more collection and distribution. That's a big deal. So you guys go to the Open FEMA website, FEMA has a commitment, this is a relatively recent change, to make data available that in the past has been very, very locked down. So there's a lot more research data, or research uh, informing data, that is available now than it has been in the past. It's important. Well, when we did a survey, to figure out where the states stand, we did a survey, uh, sent it out to all the state has a mitigation officers. Everybody know what the state has a mitigation officer does? Okay. So state has mitigation officers, we surveyed all the ones in the uh, country, and we got a shocking 54% response rate. Now, for anybody that does surveys, that is mind-blowing. You get 20%, that's a good day in those surveys. We got 54%. Uh, this is like a happy dance time for us. Really? 
more and more and more. Great. What that said in part is this is something they're interested in. And that was really neat. Now, of the 27 states that participated, 16 identified that they had flood risk websites um, that dealt with mitigation. Now, there's some interesting things that came out of that. And I'll get to that here in a second. Not all the questions were answered by all the participants. That's, that's what we expect with most surveys. There were there was one respondent that actually just finished three of the ten questions. And we did have some communicate by email uh, or phone. And those were really interesting because those were ones that, that asked us to follow up with them and say, what did you learn from this? And I'll tell you why that, that really struck us as interesting as well here in a second. We also asked, how long has your state maintained a GIS website designed to inform hazard mitigation. That was kind of interesting. The majority of them were fairly recent. Remember I said we've had GIS websites since the early 1990s? Great. So this just reaffirmed what we thought. And there's a very small number that had uh, four out of those that have been more than a decade. We had quite a number that said they did not have websites that were designed for this purpose. But the interesting part of that was we knew otherwise. That too was interesting. And by the way, remember I said I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of states, that is not unique. It's not uncommon to go between state agencies and find different answers to questions you would think. So don't make an assumption. Of the 16 states that responded that they had these websites, five, 11 of them said they're open to the public. Now, those of you that live and work in Florida, guys, you are so lucky. The open data laws here are not consistent everywhere. So, the moment you feel the inclination to complain because you don't have access to data, I got some places you can go and feel far more frustrated. Okay? There are five states that have restricted access sites. Now, one of them here, friend Chris and I are very familiar with, South Carolina. Uh, has a, uh, I'm going to just be right out and tell you, it's a wonderful platform, and I say it's wonderful because we build it for them. Um, this is an open source product that I think is really a cool example of what you can do with this. And I'm not going to demo it or you know, get into all kinds of details so this is not a sales pitch. But uh, what they decided they wanted to do was create the ability to have the stakeholders, people doing plans in the jurisdictions, have a website where they can download GIS data, they can then be used in their plans, where they can interact with look at a map and relate layers. This is just basic GIS stuff. So that part is not groundbreaking at all. They also want the ability to be able to upload plans and download them in one place. That's the portal concept. That's very, I'm sorry, that's the platform concept. So people use the term platform and portal interchangeably a lot. Don't do that. Portal is kind of a one-way street, right? Here's what we have, and this is all we have, and if you don't like it, go someplace else. Whereas a platform is a collaboration. That's what this is. They also have a mitigation track or something I'm not seeing in many of the states, which is the ability to map and query mitigation strategies. How many of you have seen mitigation plan? Most of the time, mitigation strategies, which are required part of mitigation plans, are a table in the back of the report, and that's it. And it rarely goes very far beyond that. So they're, they're mapping. And they're also mapping their funded projects so they can see the relationship between the idea and the implementation. That's pretty cutting edge. And there's a whole bunch of stuff they can do in a dashboard to get different reports to say different things. Now, we also pose the question, how many of these states have uh, interactive maps to show the relationship between risk, such as boundaries of flood inundation, people, populated areas. Now, there's plenty of examples of websites where you can go see a flood map over and on a topographic map, but it really doesn't tell you much about the people exposed to the flood. Half of those states, right, said they had that. Now take it further. How many of those states provide information about the actual physical impact, meaning how many buildings are damaged? What's the economic and social impact potentially of those? And we asked that in two different ways. And this to me was very important. I'm going to show you a great example of how it can turn out. Five of those states said that they provided information for areas bigger than a parcel. Right? 
right? So bigger than an individual homeowner, business owner, and so forth. Whereas four got right down into the individual buildings. I'm going to show you a good example here. Six of the states suggested they provided options to mitigate. Now this is the action part of it, right? This is the action part, and I think this is really important. It's fine to say you have a risk, but if you don't provide an action, that information doesn't go very far. We already know how far that takes us. It takes us where we are today. We keep having disasters to prove that. We were surprised uh, by some of the responses. It's always interesting to do a survey, because you think the question's perfectly clear, and then somebody actually interprets something differently. We got that, not surprisingly. And, and this is an academic study, so we very honest about it. In one case, we said, well, do you have an, inter oops, an interactive map that shows the relationship between flood risk and populated areas? And one of the users interpreted that to be Google Maps. Well, if you're really good, you can add your own layers to Google Maps, to be sure. But I can promise you the average homeowner can do that. But they did interpret it that way. Yep, yeah, I've got a map. So one of the things we decided to do after the survey was get on the phone. And reach out to some of these uh, mitigation managers or state mitigation officers and ask some questions. And what we started to discover was some really extensive differences in how interpretation was happening when we said things like, do you represent economic risk? Do you represent information about mitigation? Do you have X, X Y, and Z? That's one of the big findings that we took away. Right, so when you're looking at how we're addressing the risk from flood on a national basis, you have to think about how people even do <coughs> that. It's sort of what we were talking about with uh, her presentation. I mean, do you call it green infrastructure or natural infrastructure? And they may be the same thing, but if you're talking to two different people, they may not be. And the same thing applies here. Now, I, I put this state up here because, quite honestly, it seems to be the best example we found, at least in terms of the most provided information. If you've never visited this website, it is pretty darn cool. So this is the state of North Carolina. They have um, a tool called the Flood Risk Information System. It is open. You go out there anytime you want, except right now, you should be paying attention to it. Right? It is individual stakeholder focus. So you can click on a building. These are all like, totally interactive. You can click on a building. One of the things, and there's a lot more here than I'm showing you. One of the things that will pull up is the estimated building value. Um, it'll say if you, I can, you can't read this in the back, some of you. So if the building's 100% damaged, you're uncovered structural losses. That's a big deal because they're considering insurance. So they're bringing policy into question. You're looking at this particular individual for a million dollars roughly. That's 153 percent of your annual yearly income. It's making it real to the stakeholder. Tell me why it matters. Incentivize me to do something. That's the point. Don't just show me a pretty map or a boundary and say he could be in a flood map. What does that mean? They provide mitigation options. So you, homeowner, if you choose in this location to elevate your structure, the approximate cost of that is going to be about $700,000. You relocate, that's about $1.6 million, okay? If you elevate utilities to reduce risk, you're going to get about a 16 to 1 cost effectiveness. They're giving you a benefit cost ratio as well. That's a whole lot of information. Now, it's not the equivalent of an engineer getting out on the ground and make this clear and doing a site survey. That is not what it's about. I look at it as guiding the, the, the stakeholder, and in this case it's you. It's the homeowner, it's the business owner. It's the people that ultimately have to make the change. That can't happen at the policy level, right? They're putting that out there. They provide a flood insurance calculator. Well, if you make these changes, for example, change the type of foundation you're dealing with, change your base flood elevation, change your first floor elevation, what does that do to the cost of insurance? Right? And that's just pulling right straight out of the few policies. Another thing they've got is a different tool called the uh, uh, Flood Inundation Mapping and Alert Network. Now, just going to see it's really cool. I mean, it's an amazingly dynamic display. I wish I was showing this one live, because there's all kinds of pretty things going on in an animated fashion, right? So very real time, what's going on out there. But that's not mitigation. That's response. That's current operations. Here's the mitigation part. For much of the state, they actually have embedded scenarios. 
And this is interactive. This is that animation I think I heard you talking about, right? You can use this as a slider bar, and it will actually show you the growth of the area that is flooded. Very cool. And it will change this, the, the, the information down here, telling you how many buildings are damaged and what the approximate damage loss is for that. So if I'm a community decision maker, and I'm saying, you know what, could this be a problem? What does this really mean? When somebody says, oh, I heard your flood attack, does that mean? What are the implications? And one of the things I really like about it is it is the dynamic. It, you can look at the difference between the 100 and the 500 year flood, 126.7 year flood. So what it's showing you, in part, is hazards are dynamic. They don't follow the boundary. So this is, for me, it's one of the big things. So what? Uh, when I teach a class, I always, some of you have probably been in these classes, I know a couple of you have. I always, when I go through something, I always in the discussion with so what? Well, so you can do this kind of a model, so what? You know, that's great. We can do this kind of research in, in community. If you buy out all these structures, here's going to be the results. So what? Is that real? No, not necessarily. So the so what for North Carolina, 200 million hits on their website before Hurricane Florence came in. Now that doesn't astonish you, should it? And using that same data, they were able to get very quickly recovery plans back in the hands. I'm going to go through several slides real quick because we want to respect our time. Um, California has a website where you can click on a location or identify a location on the map. It's not nearly as, as rigorous as, as North Carolina, but you can get information about what actions are recommended, and then if you click one of these, it'll give you a PDF file describing what that means. So it's not nearly as personalized, but it's still relevant. There's a lot to consider when it comes to the whole question of the built environment. So Indianapolis, I think, was the first city in the country to do uh, digitally orthorectify. That means take a, a photo that has been given location in space and create a building footprint layer. And it was way back in the 1990s. But we've gone a lot further than that. Uh, Indiana is one of the states, very few states, which actually collects property assessment data at the state level, creates a vanilla flavor of that data, and as a result, we do most of the county mitigation plans in Indiana through our center. You can quickly generate a building location for all structures in the state. That's what this complicated graphic is actually saying. There are challenges with that, not the least of which is it costs money to maintain those tools. There's also been a significant lack of building footprints nationwide until recently. Okay, that's changed. There's a lot of inconsistency between camera, camera's computer-aided, uh, I'm sorry, uh, computer-aided mapping appraisal. It's property assessment data. There's a lot of inconsistencies between different versions of that, or different versions of policies and data laws, lots of stuff. If you've not heard about the, there's two big initiatives to create national level building footprints. One of them you almost certainly have heard about, you do anything with GIS, and that's the release of over 124 million building footprints from Microsoft. Everybody know about that in here? You know about GIS? Every structure in the country. Now, that's a big statement. It's not true. Because the data that they're using actually varies in terms of its generation, but it's an amazing start. They're unattributed building footprints, so they're free. You want them, go download them. The other thing that's happening is FEMA has partnered with Oak Ridge National Labs to create really good building footprints as well. The intent, is, and those two are free, by the way, that's a link to a website. You can go out to FEMA's uh, disastersplatform.gov and download them. And their goal is to get every state done by 2121. And they use that data. If you've not visited FEMA's disasters geoplatform, it's not just FEMA, it's all the federal agencies. Disasters.geoplatform.gov, real-time economic impact assessments when disasters are underway. Much of that's informed by these buildings. Okay, um, I'm going to try to wrap up pretty quick. Here we go. So, okay, here we go. So we had to ask the question: Is this does this make a difference? And, and the answer is absolutely. Every one of the states we interviewed that responded to that question said, "Yeah." Uh, with the exception of a couple that they weren't sure, they were pretty darn sure they were going to proceed. 
We did ask what they plan to do over the next few years, and the answers came back that they're, they're consistently planning to expand their capabilities, looking at interactive mapping, uh, looking at characterizing what that risk means, funding, you know, Shannon's right, it's always an issue. So there needs to be consideration given on the federal level especially to how funding dollars can be directed towards these kinds of efforts. If you are curious, and you thought the North Carolina side was cool, you might be interested to know that Florida is actually going to be doing at least a component of what those two systems I mentioned have. Um, I can spend a whole lot of time on social impacts. This is a huge area of research. It is an area of really not being addressed on these websites yet. It's a big opportunity. There's a lot of considerations. I'm going to jump over that and take you straight to the conclusions piece. So I made a statement earlier that there's a very big difference between identifying risk and incentivizing action. It's a huge difference. So North Carolina is a pretty good model for states to follow, but even that does not incentivize action. It does a really good job of defining a refined level of risk means. These websites can be effective, we believe, and there's a lot of states seeking to expand what they mean, but this is a big thing for me. Best practices need to be documented. When we did those phone interviews, consistently, every time. Well, what are you learning? What are the states doing? What can we adapt? What are the resources they're leveraging? What are the funding vehicles? Um, another group I'm very involved with, if you're familiar with the Urban and Regional Information Systems Association, anybody here know about or something? I've been a leader in ERISA for quite a while. I chair education for them, and I chair a new community resilience task force that is doing a lot of work to document these kind of data-related best practices. So if you want more information on that, catch up with me. Now, I did promise you, down to two slides, I did promise you I would tell you where the opportunities were that we see for research. One is, the question, one of the things that's happening right now is the federal government is investing a lot in building tools. I mentioned, I threw a slide up there and skipped over it, on the National Risk Index. This is gonna come out soon. And it is leveraging things like study, some of you know about, and a lot of other things, looking at 18 different hazards to come up with an index value for every community in the country. Last I heard, they're gonna put that out at that census track and then low. Right, so that's out there. So one question is, if these kind of things are happening, why are states and communities, I didn't even talk about communities, there's a lot of communities doing some cool stuff too. Why is that still happening? And what are the opportunities to leverage those two activities? Big question for me is, should there be national consistency in presenting some elements, and I have deliberately put the word some in there, because I really do believe in the uniqueness of communities and branding a model, applying it nationally is good for some questions, but not all. Okay, if you're a planner, looking at a national index has merit, especially if you're looking at a regional perspective or national. But if you are a mayor in a town trying to figure out which two buildings to mitigate, that is not helpful. It can actually be detrimental. So some elements of risk should be considered. Methodology should be consistent. What should go into those? Lots of research, and you know, for those of you involved in research, you know what I'm talking about. Two researchers asking two different questions, and a lot of times you get two different answers for the same question. This is a big one for me. How can you incentivize action? And I'm gonna quickly tell you about something without going to the slide here in a second. Um, and how can universities actually more effectively support practice? Uh, there is a report I did for FEMA on that topic that is available online if you're interested that addresses that. That was done through another series of surveys of practitioners and academics and the private sector as well, asking how can we make sure the communication channel's going properly? It's not today, right? And it's not a one-way street. Research doesn't inform practice alone. Practice should inform research. You know, what are the things the practitioners care about? Right? So there's a lot of opportunities. Um, I'll put that up there, just leave it up there before you start questions. But one of the things that I would heartily recommend considering on the incentivization side of the fence is recognizing that change does not come through policy alone through government action alone. 
And one of the things that I, the Institute that I mentioned earlier has been working with is how do you engage the private sector into helping incentivize action? And one of the ways that that's being looked at is with this concept of a resilient mortgage. Right? Now let's leave that out there while you're asking questions. But basically the idea is can you actually build into a mortgage the incentives through taxes, through insurance, through other vehicles, so that you're paying a little bit more, but what you're getting in return is a lot more. And it's not a feel-good lot more. I learned um, presenting on Capitol Hill to, you know, like Shannon, if you walk around the halls of Congress, you can learn a lot real quick. But one of the things you learn is, depending on which party you're talking to, you better be using different language because it's not the same incentives. And this is one example. I, I stood in front of a, a forum that the White House had in the previous administration and stood up there and said, you know what, I know some of you could care less and know a little bit about climate change. Some of you are just avidly resented. You know, I'm a science guy, I'm, I'm on that side, but the reality is I don't care what your position is because if you have a focus of economic development in your community and that's your priority, and you're about making the community resilient from the hazards, you can both get to the same place for different reasons. And that's what this is about. So if you want to know more about that, I'll be happy to share that with you. I think I went a little bit over, and I thank you for that. <laughs> thank you very much. So we're starting to Couple questions. We can take yeah, oh yeah, I'm excited to have a long conversation later. <laughs> so North Carolina is at the bleeding edge. Do you have any idea how much frizz costs to build? I don't, and I deliberately, okay, so I deliberately did not ask that question, but I want to make it clear I'm not immune to that question because we build those kind of systems as well. We did not build that, okay? They're not cheap. So one of the things that we need to do is look for opportunities to collaborate. And I know if you talk to a jazz corner, you know as well as I do, in many cases, if they're federally funded, they will share that technology. So this is the reason Florida is engaging in those two, those two products. So yeah, they're not cheap to build. That's a, this is the reason that I put up there the slide bullet that said, we need to look for things that we can do that have national applicability, because those are things that can be funded and reused, repurposed, build it as a pilot, build it as a proof of concept, and then apply it elsewhere. That's a very common approach in science, NSF. That's how they typically fund the grants and so forth. There's tons of opportunity to do that. And second, you had posed a question at the beginning uh, on something like this. We still see disaster losses increasing. We yep. saw it on your slide. We yep. saw it on your slide. Yep. Uh, can you speculate on why disaster losses are increasing? And of course, we can take this offline because you know there's a lot of research. There's a ton of research on it. So part of it is where do the disasters occur and what are the characteristics of the community? So again, if you have a Katrina, I was involved with Katrina in several ways, but if you have a Katrina, it's a different event than if you have a Midwestern flood. You know, the communities will be more resilient in one case than another. So the first thing is understanding the communities, right? So where are those losses increase is important. The second thing to consider, again, is the incentives. If the incentive is, you know what, I can build here and make an awful lot of money between now and the time the disaster comes along, my incentive is an economic one. That's why I said economic is a very important part of the solution. That was hard for me to grasp. Because, you know, especially when I was in the early part of my career, I had that idealistic uh, perspective that students often do. You know, we're going to make the world a better place because it's the right thing to do. An awful lot of people don't do it for that reason. They make you feel better inside, but that's not going to move people. And sometimes those people are in a position of power. So there has to be a reason. And I think there's less of that than there can be. We also have the issue of new construction versus existing construction. Right? So building beyond code is fine, but that's the new construction. But what about the existing construction? And a lot of places where bad things typically happen, that's existing old mistakes of the past. So convincing those people to do something that in many cases is not economically viable, you have to incentivize them to do that. It is not a simple question. And that's ultimately what I'm trying to imply. You're right, we have, I've had lots of conversations about that, and I'm sure we will again. Yeah. 
It is the right question. You know? um, there's a slide that I blew past that said one size does not fit all. Right? There is no, I am convinced there is no single solution. And decision makers are almost always looking for the, just tell me what the solution is. We'll find it, we'll move on, and that'll solve the problems. It doesn't work that way. So it, it's going to take a collaboration between finance, banking, realtors, builders, and so forth, planners, to solve problems. Good question. So the research that you showed there, I mean, the data there is you know, ideal for a person and a community to have. Now, how does that impact you? I mean, when you have, I mean, when a person who goes to a public site, yep. they don't have a lot of bias and blood or It is a tremendously important question. Um, a part of, so I'm going to be very forward and tell you here I am speculating. Sites like North Carolina, so that's the first thing that comes to mind. And I can tell you when I, when I talk to some of the other states about that site, there's awareness that it exists, but there's concern about privacy. And privacy really isn't the issue because you can go to any tax office, it's public records, right? It's, what are you saying about that building that can have an impact adverse or otherwise? Now the question then, the question that you have to start thinking about, and this, is, this gets into, again, this is where the academic community can and should play a role, is where is the line that you draw between concern over individual and concern over society? Right? That is not a simple question. And why one individual over another? If you get into right. the you're not affecting the guy that might buy that. That's exactly right. Right. You know, at what point do you, you make it very clear that if you're going to build in this location, you're going to lose and lose and lose and lose again, somebody's got to step in. And if putting that information on a website forces action, it may not be pleasant, but, you know, it's not an easy question. It's one that, quite honestly, that's not an area I spend a lot of time working in. It is a, it is ultimate political. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. It's been the question GIS professionals have been struggling with for years, but in the past, our maps were paper, and they went on a desk in a drawer. Now, they're digital, and they have instant ramifications. And we can't control the message once it's out there. That's a big challenge. So this is the reason that GIS and ethics has become a very hot topic lately. Yeah, I think we, we all want to break now. Uh, when we come back, we will entertain a few more questions. Is that okay? Thank you so much. Please, let's take about uh, 10, 15 minutes break. As a bit of a story about where, where, so where we got to this workshop from. So here's the background. We start by uh, thinking about community-based flood management. And the community-based part is important to us. The flood management is interesting, too. But we actually are coming at this as our primary interest is in this unit of a community, where a lot of what we talk about when we think about flood risk and how we handle it, it's often about an individual, a household, or a firm. And maybe we think about policymakers at a state or federal level setting things up, but there's that meso scale in the middle about what do we do with aggregations and collectives of people, whether they're a, represented by a jurisdiction, a government, or maybe they're not necessarily represented by a government. Maybe they're a community with a lowercase c, and they're a collective of people. And how do we think about they, their role in managing flood risk, especially because a lot of the things we need to do in managing flood risk aren't, something, aren't things that individual property owners can actually accomplish on their own. Individual atomistic units can do a lot of things, but there's a lot of things that are related to, I think, as Shannon called it, sort of flood intensifying things. A lot of that stuff is actually in the hands of communities or collectives of people. So that became you know, our unit of interest that was particularly interesting. And so we get to the community rating system, which is a federal FEMA pro program to try to deal with, with flood risk. And it's an interesting one because it's a voluntary program. You have to be part of the NFIP as a community, but then as the community, which in this case, it's a federal program, so they can't use a squishy notion like community with air quotes around it. It has to be something specific, like an incorporated uh, government or a county or something like this. So that's their notion of community. And then these communities can volunteer or participate in a program to go above and beyond what the NFIP would require as the minimums to participate in the NFIP. If you go above and beyond, 
You can do a bunch of categories, a bunch of different activities in different categories. They'll come in and give you points for the different activities you've done, and depending on how high you score, some perks come with that, in particular discounts on your uh, flood insurance premiums. Now, there might be some other perks, like presumably doing the activities in the first place were some good thing. It had some benefits to the community and possibly even to those property owners, but to sweep the deal, to put the carrot in there for this voluntary program, the feds have this flood insurance premium discount. So that's the essence of the program. We'll get into some more details about it as I go. There's been a lot of work on it, uh, and people involved in this workshop uh, uh, who couldn't be here actually have produced a lot of that research. It's all quite interesting, and so instead I'm going to talk about the stuff that Professor Sadiq and I have been working on. Uh, and so we got into this a couple years back, and our first paper in Natural Hazards, we wanted to look at the differences among participating communities, among the couple thousand communities doing the CR, thousand or so communities in the CRS. We wanted to see how they behaved and how they were different. And in particular, we thought maybe they're being a bit strategic in how they engage and play the game with the CRS. And so what do, you, what do I mean by strategic? Well, I'll give you a little graph here. This is, as of a few years back, the histogram that shows the frequency, the number of communities at different scores, different point levels in the CRS program. So to even get in the program, you have to score at least 500 points, and then you're class nine. And then if you can get over 1,000 points, you can be class eight. And eventually, you can work up to like almost hypothetical class one and gets bigger discounts. So you're incentivized along the way, you get bigger and bigger discounts each class you get to. But being at the bottom of class eight versus the top of class eight, the perks are the same. So we saw this tiered system, and we looked at the frequency tables, and it looks as though communities were aware of the tiers. They were not just going out and picking their scores uh, based on some cost-benefit analysis that had nothing to do with getting to the next level. There seemed to be this sawtooth thing. There's an interest in getting just above or not falling just below to the next tier. So one thing we were interested in is how are the communities just above and just below the thresholds different from one another? And our first hypothesis we actually wanted to test is, are they doing different kinds of things? Is there some kind of activity that's very common among those upgrading to get to the next class? And we also wanted to look, is there something different about the uh, sort of size or wealth or, you know, of the communities, other characteristics of the communities. And basically what we found when we compared class eights, the ones who are just above and made it to class eight, those who are at class nine just below, we saw that the class eights did get more credits for information-based activities rather than regulatory activities, things we call passive credits. We saw that they actually tended to have less flood risk when they were in, in class eight versus class nine. They were smaller or had less population density. They actually had lower housing values. And then when we compared, went up a notch and compared the class sevens, which you had just gotten to class seven versus those well, who just fell short, so class eight. We saw that those who were able to make it to class seven had statistically larger payrolls for the size of their local governance, uh, and they were a bit wealthier. But they weren't doing anything differently in terms of the types of they were getting from being just above and just below. And so this, this was our first, our first stat at the CRS. It was kind of fun, but I'm not sure we were asking the most interesting questions. So our next paper was looking at why some communities would participate and some wouldn't. So their decisions to join the CRS and, and participate in this or not. And then given that they were participating in it, how many points did they go and get? So the intensity of participation in my fault. We didn't look at one type of activity versus another. We just looked at their total score. And one of the things we found is you know, the size of the government, having more employees, having more staff, made them more likely to participate, although it didn't actually make them more able to get more points, but it did predict them joining the CRS Hall. Uh, wealthier, uh, wealthier communities were less likely to join, but uh, they also tended to join when they had higher housing values. Uh, more new population growth made them more likely to join, and having higher flood risks made them more likely to join. That alone, I guess, was, was comforting. Uh, but it's also interesting that higher flood risk was not associated with having more points conditional on joining. Uh, the fact that they have a higher risk made them more likely to join, but it didn't mean they did more in terms of, of mitigation on the CRS. So 
what the, one of the next things we wanted to look at, when we so pull a map, all the little black outline areas are the jurisdictions of communities that are in the CRS. And so we can see they're scattered pretty widely around the US, not evenly, of course. They're concentrated where you probably would expect them to be concentrated roughly, but you can find some participating communities out in some uh, perhaps unexpected areas as well. And we wanted to see if essentially the participation is contagious. Uh, does a community become more or less likely to participate in the CRS if their neighboring community is participating in the CRS? And, and there's a couple reasons for this. The most obvious one shouldn't actually take much thinking, and it should just be if one community thinks it's worth joining, the other neighboring community might think it's worth joining because they, sh they face a lot of the same risks. They face a lot of the same issues and challenges. So because flood risk itself is sort of contagious, it's spatially correlated with itself, that's a good reason why we might expect to see that happen. But there's other reasons we might expect to see it happen too. They could be under the same state set of rules and incentives. And so when one person is able to that someone else might, it could be that they're learning from each other, or you're talking to their neighbors, maybe even sharing staff as someone moves across county lines or something. It also could be that it's contagious in the reverse way. That when the upstream community does a bunch of stuff, the downstream community says, thank you. Or maybe they don't even say thank you. <laughs> they just enjoy not having to go through the extra trouble. So we wanted to look at this. And the first thing we found, but yes, it was, uh, it, it does look sort of quite contagious. Uh, and, and the interesting part was that even after we controlled for a wide range of different measures of flood risk, climate, topography, and, and other socioeconomic factors, once we controlled for all of that, it was still contagious. So the part we couldn't explain, the overachieving communities and the underachieving communities tended to cluster around each other. And so that was interesting. And we didn't find any really strong evidence there of that free riding type of incentive. Uh, there is some, we're still working on this paper. So in the next entry, uh, we also wanted to look at does participating in the CRS affect outcomes? Things like income inequality was the first one we looked at. So, by participating in the CRS, do you do something to affect, maybe you're, you're scaring out the, the, the mobile homes and the people who are more vulnerable because you've got design and your extra mitigation programs are targeting those vulnerable people, you're trying to shift them out. Or maybe because you've given a sweeter incentive in terms of a discounted flood insurance premium and the people who are best able to get a hold of that are the wealthier, you're actually encouraging wealthier people to move into the community. Or maybe you're actually doing more to mitigate and reduce the flood risk, essentially. And the people who are best able to respond to that are at the high end of the income and not low end. It could go either way on this in theory. So we wanted to see what was happening. And in essence, what we found was that the CRS participation in general was, was attracting higher to top earning income categories. And that was especially true in the flood plains or high flood risk areas of the communities. And if anything, it was actually pushing out the poor or uh, poverty rates were falling in floodplains that were in CRS communities. So in that sense, by getting rid of the poorest and adding in more of the wealthiest, we actually reduced income inequality in census tracts that were in the highest risk areas inside CRS communities. Long-winded way of saying that. And then we've got a couple new papers that are just coming out about the effect on population and housing development and long story short on this, uh, it looks like, first of all, CRS communities as a whole have lower population growth rates uh, after joining. And that's mildly interesting to me. The more interesting part is not what happens on average or the typical area inside a CRS community, but what happens in the parts of the CRS community that are actually at the highest flood risk. And there we don't see as much of a an impact on population growth. If anything, the high flood risk areas are growing faster in CRS communities than the rest of the CRS community, but that's just because the CRS communities are putting the brakes on development. It's just not encouraging more development or not encouraging much less development either in the high flood risk areas. So on average, CRS participation does not appear to be doing much to population growth in the riskiest areas, which might be mildly consoling if we thought the alternative was publishing would be going up even faster. So at least we're not doing that. 
right? It's one of those cases where we found no significant effect. Maybe that's a good thing. And then we've got another new paper coming out that basically shows from a different approach that there's no big effect of CRS uh, on track level population growth in, uh, in, in floodplain areas. We do see a little bit less turnover, which I think is a bit interesting. But not what I want to dwell on for the next 15 minutes. What I want to talk more about is what the academic side of things we call the endogeneity of participation. Uh, and, and I'll go through what this means in a bit, but a lot of the research that was on like that second slide and stuff we're doing has to confront a big problem of the fact that this is a voluntary program. It's not a good controlled experiment. We don't have randomized controlled trials where you can say, you're in the computer, you're in the program, and you're not. And you have to take a placebo pill, and somehow this placebo CRS. The analogy doesn't work. And so we have to be pretty creative. We're concerned, or I'm especially concerned, about how participation decisions might be interdependent between communities. That alone will screw up most of our statistical analyses of the effects of, of participating with CRS on anything. And I'm concerned, and that's the focus for today, as in the second bullet, which is about something that we can't observe that's different between the participating community and the non participating community. We have lots of reasons to think they're not just flipping a coin in terms of deciding to join this, but we can't explain fully why some are joining and why some aren't. We've got a lot of that explanation is missing. So we want to get at this, and part of the reason we want to get at this, the so what question in a way, is that it's academically interesting, but more importantly, it's going to be important for any of the policy questions we might want to have. Some of the biggest policy questions I've run into when thinking and talking to people about the community rating system, the CRS program, is about take up rate. Are the right communities participating and are enough communities? Have we optimized participation in the CRS? And I naively went into this topic when I first started researching it, assuming that, like most of voluntary environmental programs, the ideal goal is 100% take up. They would, in a perfect world, we'd love if everyone had energy efficient light bulbs. In a perfect world, we'd love if everyone did all this low flush toys. We want to make everything voluntary. Everything would be voluntarily as green as possible. And the more I talk to anybody at FEMA about this, is they, they shudder at the idea that they would get anywhere near 100% take up rate. They can't afford it. Partly because this thing is revenue neutral, and so the more communities that join end up raising the rates for all the non joiners. And that's a bit of a problem, politically, if nothing else. But it's also not clearly a really good idea for literally every community to be doing above and beyond, kind of not one size fits all thing, right? Even though it's a pretty flexible program, some communities should be down to the bottom. And that would just be out. So there's some interesting questions. But to get at that question of the question number one, it really depends on how we understand about why certain communities are even voluntary in the first place. The second set of questions is the so, so what question of, all right, so if you have joined, what good is that going to do you? And being able to measure and estimate the impact of joining, we can't do unless we know why people join in the first place. Because we have to control for that endogenous treatment. We have to control for the fact that it's not random control trials. You can't just say, you took the drug and you didn't take the drug and look at the outcomes and compare. We actually have to understand why we're joining in the first place so we can control for that selectivity. And that's where we're going with this NSF grant we wrote in the workshop from our, my perspective today. So when Professor Siddiqui and I wrote this, the original proposal was saying, we want to know what drives community decisions to participate in a voluntary federal program like the CRS. And while flood management is interesting in general, the more general, the more interesting question to the scholarly side, the science side of things, is there's a lot of voluntary environmental programs out there. Almost all of them, almost all the research is targeted at why firms would do stuff or why households would do stuff and go above and beyond and be green and be weird. We, we've got some literature and some theory about why somebody would do the above and beyond. But those somebodies are CEO types or head of household types. We don't know much about why communities would do the above and beyond stuff. So that became scientifically kind of interesting. And I think it's also nice to be of good pragmatic importance as well. So we wanted to look at, at that and start thinking more about why, why some are participating and some are. And in the end, we said we're going to get a bunch of people like you guys together and have a fun conversation. So that's today. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we, we conceptualized this idea of choosing to participate or not dependent on a bunch of these factors. And you can come up with 
Any of these are all kind of circle and arrow that have diagrams and they're cheap and almost worthless that, that way. But we have a diagram of circles and arrows. And, and I, I want to draw one other big circle on here because as we pitched it, we thought there's things which the academic side of things, we, we call these things unobservables. We go out and measure you know, how wealthy is the community. I can measure how many workers are, are staffed by the county. I can measure property values. I can measure a bunch of stuff, but I can't measure is this a valued activity? I can't measure the, measure the attitudes of the people making the decisions. I can't even measure the process by which the community makes this decision. I mean, I could, but out of 20,000 communities out there, this is why I have to go sort of door to door and spend a lot of time doing sort of ethnographic anthropological work. It's a lot of, I can't just go to the Census Bureau and pull up this kind of data. It's not easily readily available. It's unobserved to me as the lazy arms length researcher type that I am. That's a cost ratio for any given activity under the CRS menu of options. We don't have data on that that we can explain for every community that's out there. So we had a problem. So there's a bunch of factors we think would factor into this, but we couldn't observe them. So that leads us to this challenge, is about getting at those unobservables. So we take what I'm going to call a matching approach. Uh, and the crux of the challenge of this is if the CRS is voluntary, we, to do a lot of this analysis, we need to identify who the control group would be or what the counterfactual would be. What would happen to the community in a world where it didn't join? What would that community look like? What would the outcomes be if it had not joined? But we don't ever get to observe it. If the community joined, we don't have another version. We don't have the ultimate reality. So we often think of a control group. Well, we'll find some other group that would be the control. Identifying the control group for the adjoining community which is the non-joiner for part again, we don't have this experiment. So there is luckily lots of evidence about why some communities choose to participate and some don't. It explains a third of the joining, a third of the variation why some join and some don't join. Two-thirds are still black boxes, mystery. But at least we explain about a third of it based on the observables. And so we're going to use that. Uh, but again, those are all different based on observables. We think that these communities are probably really different than things that we don't normally get to see. So that pushes us down the path of how do we get at those unobservables? We have to go observe them. We actually have to go talk to these communities, people in the communities. And that's not so easy. It takes a lot of work or at least a lot of money. So that's why we need the NSF to get us down this path. And so they gave us funds that let us go out and talk to people in the communities and get past the arm's length data that people like me typically rely on. And we wanted to find out essentially how their contexts and how their decision processes work and how they might be different from one, one area or one community to another. But we're looking at 20,000 uh, communities that are possible, that are eligible to participate in this, and about 1,200 to join. Yeah, it's up to 1,500 now, right? Yeah. So, out of 20,000, though, I can go and pick. I, and I can't pick that many, because this is a lot of labor-intensive stuff to go talk to them. So let's say I get to pick 100. If you pick 100 random draws out of the 20,000 communities, you're unlikely to get Orlando or a big city in that at all. But maybe you wouldn't want to, because you're going to get a bunch of teeny little places you've never heard of who are at no odds of ever joining the CRS in the first place. Pulling couple hundred random draws out of a pool of 20,000, it's going to be literally all over the map, but not just geographically all over the map. These things would be so incomparable in terms of their context and processes, we would need a large, a massive sample of that in order to be able to get past all the noise that we'd be bringing in accidentally. So that's where this matching part comes in. We wanted, because we're stuck with a small end, a small group of people to pull, we wanted to match ones who had joined and ones who hadn't joined who looked as statistically similar on the observed features that we can find, as similar as possible. And then we can explore the things that are unobserved previously and see, well, how might their contexts and things be different in a more qualitative, subtle way. So we use this matching approach, essentially, to weed out a lot of the noise that would be there from picking a small sample from a large pool of really heterogeneous possible cities. So, we match the communities based on their likelihood, based on those observables, their likelihood of participating. So the idea is they were just as likely to join, the one that did, the one that didn't, and equal odds of joining, but they probably aren't identical in every other way. So let's take a look. Why, why did one join and one didn't? 
So essentially, we're trying to get clones, air quote clones, not actual clones. So we find the one community that did join in its clone, and we want to ask them similar questions and, and try to learn. And unfortunately, though, the clones can only be based on what, observable features. So the, usually, you do these kinds of approaches in order to then say, all right, we've got your community to join, and you've got its clone community, and then we look after the hurricane hit, who got more damage? We're not going to get to that point yet, as I say. Instead, we wanted to see, well, that only works as a comparison if there weren't things that were different that we could observe between them that were also relevant to how you would say sustain damage. And we know it's even checked to see how those unobserved things may or may not be the same. So that's actually the point of this exercise, is to scratch beneath the surface and look at some of those unobservables and see, well, are they in fact the same? Or at least, if they're different, are they relatively different? So how do the haves and have-nots Different. That's the point of all of this. It's work in progress, as I'll explain here. We, our goal is we're going to go out and interview 100 communities that have joined and 100 clones, ones that are equally likely to have joined but didn't. We're going to ask them a bunch of community flood management related questions and we're going to essentially compare their answers to these things. And that sounds not at all rocket science. So, now for cold call. Uh, Again, the goal to explore these unobservables, we're not yet trying to get at comparing outcomes, things like damages or, or, or whatnot. We want to see whether or how these participants and non-participants differ. And we're going to use that matching approach to reduce the noise because we would otherwise be really noisy comparisons. So how similar are they? And when we, we got into this, give you an example of why it would matter if we were to look at outcomes. We do this basic matching estimators, a nice statistical analysis. And if I took an outcome measure like flood damage over the last five years, as reported in Shellis, and as far as I can tell, this would be a terrible use of that data. So I've got a little asterisk there. Don't try this at home. This is absolutely not correct in any way at all. But I put it up there to illustrate how one would normally use this kind of approach. If you look at the, in this case, we have about 1,250 communities that we had data on that had joined the CRS test of 2013, and then the other you know, 18,000 we had data on that hadn't. The average per capita weighted flood damage in the last five years was $248 for the participating communities and only $171 for the non participating communities, which, while it's not statistically significantly different, isn't a a good advertisement for the CRS as reducing flood damages. But we should also think that of the non-participating communities, many of them aren't at much flood risk anyway, and there's a reason they didn't join. So once you weigh it and do this sort of paired comparison of the ones who did join and their clones, and once you look at that comparison, the $240 should be compared to the matched non-participating communities, and their average flood damage was four. Almost a distance significant, depending on your difference, but a much more appropriate and sort of intuitive kind of comparison, which would suggest there's real value in being able to match correctly so that you're not you're comparing apples to apples as much as possible. But we're not going to quite do that yet, because we need to actually be able to, in order to do that, we still need to also say that the other cloned apples sort of have other unobserved features that are the same. So we try to get at that. We're, we started with 2013 as our base year with an end of about 22,000. And we had, because this, is, this isn't the current number, which is closer to 1,500. We were down at about 1169 CRS communities in our data and about 20,000 that weren't. And we, we found out of those 20,000 the closest match based on their propensity to join the CRS. Now, in order to show, another way to show that this matching matters, so on the left column of this figure here is a bunch of the variables we use to generate the propensities to join. It includes things like aggregate housing value or regular property value, average housing value, and what's down at the bottom of risk, uh, flood risk in the community, uh, percent white, percent of poverty, a bunch of demographic things as well. So a lot of these variables, and if you look at the dots along this, the dots are showing for each of those variables how if you didn't weight the samples, if you just took the full set of 
20,000 that didn't join and 1,200 that did join, and you compare the average of the, the average values of these different variables between the two, you'd see that the ones who didn't join had wildly lower flood risks. The ones who did, didn't join had much higher levels of total housing value and things like that. They aren't apples to apples. These are apples to oranges. And then once you do the matching, you get the little X's where they're much closer, much more closely lined up. So the average of the pairs that have been matched for each of these variables is a lot like the average of the ones who actually participated. And there's another way we can show this. One other set of graphs for this. And then the, the bias, the percent that these things are different between the two, the full sample and, and the participation is in the top. And it's a sort of flat spread where the comparisons are all over the place. And then if you do the matching, you see that on average, the paired average variables are, have that mean value that are really close to what the treated ones are. So they, they're lined up nicely. Another way to look at this is that, well, the propensity model matched about a quarter of the participation, it explained about a quarter of the participation decisions, and that's really statistically significant. They're also significantly biased in terms of they're not the same looking communities. And once you look at the matched sample, using all of those variables to explain why one group joined and another explains nothing. Why? Because we've already used it to pick which groups. So they're already the same based on those variables. And so they look the same and we can't explain why one group joined and one didn't. It almost looks random. That's the principles. We've almost randomized why one is in and one isn't because the pairs, one did join, one didn't, and they look based on the same otherwise. So, last thing, when we do this, we have to make sure that there's pairs of the communities that are in and the communities that are out. We have to make sure that statistically, those matches are even present in the data. And it turns out, so if you look at the top part of this graph, this is the frequency counts for different communities across the different likelihoods of joining the CRS, based on how much we would predict that they were likely to join. And you can't quite see it, it's a little green out on the right, but there's some, a couple of communities that our model would say are more than 80% likely to have joined, which is really certain for something that's fundamentally this unpopular, to say that, wow, they are really likely to join. So we had a couple of those. And if you look at the blue, the bottom part, this is the ones who didn't join. Both our model predicts most of them who didn't join really had no likelihood of joining in the first place anyway. They didn't join and no one's surprised. But um, above that blue line, there's still sort of a good red stack. There's a bunch of communities that statistically look like they had no business joining, but in fact they did. And that's an interesting one because we can match those unlikely participants with the unlikely non-participants. And we can go all the way out on this, but we worry that out here, there aren't a lot of non-participants. The ones who are relatively likely to join don't have a lot of clones. And so that's a re an important reality. So a lot of what we're doing are matching on these unlikelies rather than matching on the ones who are almost certain in the first place. But we only had to throw out a couple observations, which were the green ones, because they actually lacked a clone. They were so likely to join, we didn't have anyone in the non-joining that was that likely to join and didn't join. But only a handful had to get thrown out that way. All right. So, we, we took these communities and their four nearest matches, their four nearest neighbors or nearest clones, and we went and pulled up, I should say we, Jenna went, the person who helped with the uh, registration, she went and pulled up the contact information, the best contact per point of contact we could get for all 100 plus all 400 potential clones. So we have this big spreadsheet and how to get a hold of them by phone and by email, and we took, this, this 100 communities came out of the 1,200 participants. We pulled the random 100 and we found out there are 400 nearest clones. And the goal was to go ahead and interview the floodplain manager or the closest approximation of one in each of these communities. So we had two different interview scripts, one for those who were in CRS and one for those who weren't. The ones who weren't in the CRS, we didn't want to ask you, like, what kind of activities are you doing in the CRS? Because they're not in the CRS, right? So we asked them instead, why aren't you in the CRS? What is wrong with you? Uh, those kinds of questions. So we pre-tested this thing in September. We put it out in the field later in September, October, November, December, and we've been sort of cold calling uh, the, the people on our list ever since. It's a mix. There's some closed-ended questions. We say, like, on a scale from one to five, how concerned are you about, or how concerned is your community about flood risk? On a scale from one to five, 
How would you rate your community's responsiveness to flood events? Things like this. We have some closed-ended ones, but other things like what are the obstacles to doing more flood mitigation in your community? Uh, what are the things you guys think about? What are the decision processes? So we've got some really open-ended, qualitative type things as well. So the survey went out. They filled out this form. We have the Institute for Social and Behavioral Sciences here at UCF do all the calling and emailing. So luckily, I didn't actually have to do this arduous work of calling people and not getting them to respond. Uh, the response rates, unsurprisingly, were terrible, uh, especially for the non-CRS communities. And the simple biggest problem with that wasn't that they didn't like us, it's that we didn't know who to call. They're not participating, they don't have a CRS coordinator, they don't have anyone on file, and it's easy for anyone to just say, no, not my department, not my call, and pass the buck, metaphorically, to not have to even deal with this. Uh, so we had some response rate challenges, but we also had some I think crazy diligence on the part of IBIS to keep following up and, and keep hammering away at this. The other part of the issue is a lot of the names and information, contact information we gave were out of date within a couple months anyway, because turnover is real. So it's it's tricky. Even among the 49 CRS coordinators we contacted, uh, what is it, 34? We got we had 45 different job titles when we asked them out of the 49. Respondents. We have 45 different job titles, and we asked what the department are doing. We got 34 different answers. So after three months, uh, we ended up having 65 completed CRS surveys, which I guess is a 65% response rate, pretty good, and only 38 matches for them. So IBIS was like, this is a shocking little so it's terrible. So we went and drew some more names, some more communities, and some more matches for them. Gave 50 more, and as of two weeks ago, we're up to 49 communities on one side and 49 clumps. So we basically have 100 communities. We're not done yet, but <coughs> it's all still a work in progress. But these are my not preliminary results, these are my premature results. They're even more preliminary than preliminary. Because we're not, we're not there yet. We're going to wait until we get to the end of collecting the data and then really dig in. But I knew I had to go here, so I wanted to show you some stuff. So here, we cracked open the data, I cracked open a little bit, and just looked not at the qualitative open-ended stuff, but more at the closed-ended scale from one to five type questions. We asked how long have you worked there, these kinds of uh, easy to convert into statistical analysis types of questions. So I'm going to take the convenient stuff. We're going to unpack the open-ended things later. It'll be fun. So here's average number of years of experience for the people we talked to in the CRS community and then in non-CRS communities. And we've got you know, eight years about, how many people are in your department? 40 versus 76, which I think is an interesting one I'm looking forward to unpacking. Why the non-CRS communities look like they've got more bigger staffing, and I think the answer is going to be, in many cases, they're just listing how many people work for the town. And in this case, they're listing how many people work in their flood management department, because they're more specialized, not because it's actually a smaller unit of government. Uh, how much schooling have you had? How old are you? Gender? None of those are statistically significantly different between the two groups. They're basically the same, across the board. We get a little bit of difference here, and that's where the asterisks come in. So we ask them, how would you rate the quality of the decision processes your community undertakes with respect to flood management? Participating in the communities rated it about the same. How big of a concern is flooding in your community? And there's a significant difference right there. The not participants weren't so concerned about it. And again, these communities objectively have about the same flood risk as the, as the participating ones, but subjectively not so much. Uh, you know, how big your flood is, is a problem in your community, not so much. But then other things were quite similar. How prepared are you for floods? Uh, how do you rate your flood mitigation efforts? They were actually based on the same between the two groups. Uh, did your community consider benefits before deciding to join the CRS? Of course we did it. They all did, not statistically diff different. Just one group said the benefits were enough, apparently. Uh, so, same thing to say the same stuff. Not statistically significantly different on these things. So, let me go to the end here, which is, unsurprisingly, even on a lot of these measures, these communities weren't all that different. We matched them on other variables so that they would be the same. But on these other things that are harder to measure, they were also still pretty similar. And they were actually fairly similar in attitude. More fully, but a lot of their attitudes look really remarkably similar. There were some big differences in terms of specialization and departmentalization, and it looks like there's going to be some big differences in terms of the types of commentary that they were given. 
the types of obstacles they face, the types of limitations. And so we have to go and unpack that. One of the big things I'm interested in is how they're expressing limitations and resources and how that's different between the two the participating and their clones. Uh, there's a big challenge here in general about making inferences about the differences between these two communities, especially once we say, all right, let's only look at the, the coastal communities. Let's only look at these types of communities. You start splitting 49 and 49, now you cut that in half. And then you say, well, now let's look at all the ones that are counties and not cities. And now you cut that one in half. And so we're, we're going to run out of ability to make strong inferences on such a small end. But it's a start. So our next step uh, after the start is to finish the interviewing, do some more textual analysis. And, and we want to look at particular aspects of the CRS program. We did ask them a bunch of different questions about what are the things you're thinking of doing? What do you think the CRS could do better? But we also have to think like, what are you already doing for these different categories of activities you're not getting credit for? What are you planning on changing in the future? How do you go about making decisions about changing what you're doing? So we're going to unpack all of that and have a lot of fun with it. Uh, and the last thing I want to mention, as we'll probably get to it in the ne next little bit, is about the public's role in a lot of these sort of official uh, decisions that the governments are taking. How does the public actually get involved and how do these people talk about involving the public in that if they even talk about it at all? Uh, so on that, I will stop and say thank you. Thank you, Doug. Thank you very much, Doug. Um, so uh, the next thing that we're going to Ask uh, questions for Doug. Just a few questions. Anybody? Yeah, sorry, I can not mind. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sean. Oh, I was the non-academic part was really interested in the graph you showed initially of how everybody laid out um, by the different classes uh, back in what 2012 or 14, I think. It was a very, very I was wondering if you, in any of your studies, had looked at that over time, and the initiation of CRS, and so that in theory you might see a hump moving through and then getting into higher classes over time. Okay. Uh, so you did, you have seen that. Yeah, and actually it's a shame that, that Craig Lander could yeah. make a comment. He just actually had a paper come out last year that looks at the persistence. So one thing that has been established, the guys at, at Wharton showed, the persistence of, of credits in a voluntary program like this and the persistence in the program is probably unheard of There's for federal no programs. Backside, right? There's not, not, people barely ever leave. And often when they, the story is when they do leave the program, it's because of the state mandate that prevents them from actually continuing to participate. So like when communities quit, it's against their will in a way. And then when they're in, what you see is there's a stronger, not persistence just of being in the program, but a growth. An, an incremental growth that is, is robust, and so for as long as they're in it, they're creeping up. <coughs> so, like, that that. when I talk to some of the folks, leadership at ASFPM, Association of State Floodplain Managers, their sense, uh, this is not a scientific survey, uh, is that the CRS system is saturated, that those who want to join are in, and that those that need to join <coughs> are in, and that, you know, why focus on? the other folks. But I was curious, because somebody back here was shouting out, hey, no, there's now the numbers up to this. So do we think that that's a reflection of growing risk and understanding and uh, you know new flood experience for towns? Do we have any sense of that? It's a good question. I mean, I haven't done this as the, the joining models. We have not done this or as over time. And we haven't done that to see if the sort of factors driving joining are, are changing over time. The closest I've done to it is more of that contagion stuff. So showing that when you're surrounded by communities that have joined, become more likely. So it could be that a lot of the growth in the program is a normal diffusion of a technology, a diffusion of a thing, and then there's adopters coming later. It's not because they've suddenly seen the light or seen the water and now decided they need to join. It could be that though, but I think some of it can be, the only stuff I've done is to be able to explain it by diffusion. I think there's, so the growth of those that are within the program, so the intensification of their participation, I think is a huge deal. And adding more sort of marginal, additional ones is another interesting question. I mean, there's cases where you're like, these communities really should be in there and they're 
not, and you're sort of shocked when you realize they're, they're not, they're not even in FIP or something. Uh, so there's still some cases where I think there'd be some clear winners to have joined. Uh, but I think most, they're, they're, I've gotten the same sense that saturation, to some extent, is, is there. To me, in either case, whether we've got all the right ones in or not, or we're not, I still want to know why we're joining so that I, I need to know that in order to be able to identify and measure the effects of joining, even if it's fairly static now. I still need to know why they're joining in the first place. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, Josh Obermeyer, I'm the flow plan coordinator and CRS coordinator for Charlotte County down the uh, southwest coast here in Florida. But uh, my previous job, I was a, um, a state CRS expert for the state of Florida and helping out communities all over the state to either improve their existing standing, they were already in, it, uh, to join if they were interested. And we even brought this opportunity to 208 communities over three years to run through a community systems visit. And then, oh, by the way, there's this, uh, there's this community rating system that you may be interested in, because it's kind of created a lot of things that you're already doing. And, um, and we're also trying to help sort of set up support networks, what are called uh, CRS user groups, so that communities could engage with each other and to uh, one of the things that are working in their neighborhood community, they got into a class five, but they're about class eight, and then, hey, yeah, we need that. We just need a document better. So, uh, a lot of the top of this chart, for example, um, as someone who has scored CRS uh, applications, a lot of times the uh, the eyes of CRS um, specialist will sort of stop once they have crossed the threshold. They're not going to get to that next five hundred. Why bother? Yeah. So that's kind of like you got that uh, cascading waterfall type of thing. Or if they're just shy, they'll, they'll go and really search for additional points to bump them up to the next class. So that's, you know, and I'm sure you yeah. assume that. And, right. No, and I, I don't know if you keep going, but I, I wanted to emphasize the point. Like, so the activity in Florida for sort of investing at the state level to get everybody on board, and so you can totally see that today. Kansas is another one where a really active community at the state level and, and from their state level, I mean, my understanding, went and helped sell CRS all around the state. It's the and, yeah. and it's, the, the data totally show it. I can control for everything up and down, and I can put in a dummy variable for Kansas, and bloop, it's a big significant bump. Same with Florida, there's a, one or two more, and then a couple that are negative, like there's, I guess, someone in the state going around saying, don't join. <laughs> but there, you can, you can see it. So it, it it works statistically, and if you ever need to prove you made an impact, for that on your resume, I can give you the, the data. Uh, one other thing I want to mention specifically about CRS is because there's about 1,500 communities that are in CRS out of the 22,000 plus communities that are in the National Flood Insurance Program. That 1,500 um, communities represents about 70% of the policies in the nation. Yeah. Um, right, or, or, yeah. Up or down, but. Yeah. Um, well, that's part of the saturation. Exactly. You know, and so the communities that need to be in, at least from the, um, the number of policies, the, the value of the risk, they're in. The others are dispersed so, so much that you know, one thing we found is that it, they're sort of dividing on, at least in Florida communities, whether you had more or less than 40 policies in the special flood hazard area, that was sort of the, the good indicator of whether you would be in or not. Now there are just communities in, in the CRS in Florida that have Single digit policy, seven, I believe, is the lowest. I don't know, it just kind of blows my mind because it's a lot of paperwork, documentation, and effort to save seven people money on flood insurance. But there's other benefits as well. So. Yeah, and that's so one of the things I, I've been in since the economist when we look at these things is it, are you getting 1,800 points because you just did 1,800 points worth of new stuff in order to get that prize? Or were you doing 1,700 points all along and you just weren't in the system? And so now you're getting points. Credit and a subsidy for something you were doing all along in a sort of free market. And you, there's cases of both clearly throughout the system. There's a lot of variety. And it's interesting to try to identify how much of this is new activity versus just getting credit for previously invested work, right? You're just documenting and, and filing it in the right way. Uh, and so, one thing that was, was, was really interesting, but I should have kept my back. I could have put a bowl in um, I don't know. <laughs> Where's people behind you? Well, that's true. Um, my question pertains to bureaucratic hurdles. I know enhanced mitigation status is something that makes tremendous sense for states to achieve. And yet, last I checked, there were only 12 states that had done it. And talking to 
people within those states, the reason they often don't do it is because of the bureaucratic complexity of dealing with that. And I'm curious about whether your experience that is the reason, in part at least, the communities may or may not choose to be part of this. Are you talking about the AMAP process or any element of the bureaucratic process? Because it just that has to be the bottom line. Well, I, I don't know enough of that one in particular, but I think part of the story we see in this is getting in the system is key. Right. Because it, 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 there's a large fixed cost to getting in. But once you're in, you start, you have the expertise and you get the momentum. And you've got the dialogue, you've got the processes from a bureaucratic standpoint built in, and you don't have to keep fighting for a new thing. It's a big fixed cost, you just do the incremental. And the incremental march over time leads to a big thing. So it's sort of a two tier approach, which is get in the system cheap and then work on once you're there is key. And big hurdles are, are big hurdles. I've done this in that too, because you, you, you don't want to be the community that backslides and loses discounts that your, that your citizens are already enjoying. So there is typically some level of support, maybe minimal, but some level of support from the administration, from the elected officials to, to at least stay where you are, if not approve. Um, right. Yeah, loss of version is a big yeah. We even have communities that are afraid to go up a class because they may lose some funding in some future year and fall back, and then they would they would be worse off than just staying where they are and, and being happy with you know some place in the world. So yeah, and now we're getting as we say. So when you've got two thirds or almost three quarters of all the policies out there under, under CRS to add a new policy or add a new community, you've got. The discounts that that's getting is not spread over all the policies out there. It's only spread over a third of that policies that are remaining. So it's almost like a three to one multiplier in terms of the cost imposed on the other constituents. So as the share goes up, the saturation gets really big because this is not, a, not a, there's no new funding for this program. So it's zero sum. And when the lion's share is in the system, whatever the opposite of the lion's share is, the sheep share, uh, <laughs> it's, it's really costly. One other thing I want to talk about, because we talked about that, that, uh, that gradual bump in the, in the curve, uh, the CRS program initially back in 1990 when, when communities had, um, first joined the CRS, um, it was mandatory or impossible to join anything other than a class nine. And then so you got your feet wet and you read the manual a little bit more and it's a 641 page manual if anybody's not, not seeing this thing. But you get more familiar with it and you go and you document some more points and then when ISO comes back in five years, you document some more and that's why you, part of why you see that, that graph little stair step. Yeah, I think there's some interesting stuff that we need to get into if we really, we had a lot of time and, 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 and resources for it. Things like the, such a different open space, the, the credits you get for that, a lot of the open space protection, communities don't actually have control over. It's completely out of their hands. It could be a, a national forest or something in there. It can be national, it's got to be a state. State, but it's still at a level they can't actually manipulate. Or there's some things where it's been it's been locked up 30 years ago or something. It's not on the table. And so some communities, in a way, are endowed with a great deal of points through no fault of their own, and others don't get it. And those become huge bumps to some communities who haven't done any really additional investment. But also, then it's really hard for them to keep growing the same way. Other communities. So that there's a great deal of variation that way in terms of sort of an endowment of points that you can get for sort of structural reasons. And, and I think that's that's an interesting part of this that is generally again unobserved. It's hidden. You have to really dig into each community's situation. So so you mentioned the unobservables, and, and one of the things that you touched on was you know the social volume for kind of making flood mitigation sexy, right? That's the, the challenge, right? Because everybody knows that the green initiatives are kind of sexy. It's, you know, water cooler talk, maybe, you know, offsetting carbon credits, that's like a social thing in, in social circles and whatnot. Um, what do we do as the practitioner side to make it, what, what's the message we want to convey to kind of mainstream uh, flood mitigation more so that it's sexy? I mean, what's, what's the answer? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. but what imagery can you associate with flood mitigation? You know, when we're out and about in the community and stuff to make people want to buy in, that they can say this is every bit as important as you know, clean air, you know, uh, clean energy, things like that, to make them buy in, and then that will kind of segue 
into like what's the threshold that you need to um, to compile the data? How how much buy-in do you need in order to compile that? Does that make sense? Like no, not the last bit. So like um, what's the what's the subset? How much grouping do we need to make the uh, the data measurable? Like what's what's the minimum that we would need? Like is it a Two percent of your, you know, your community's buying into mitigation. Now you have a um, right. Some significant metric. Exactly. No. Good question. Uh, so yeah, I mean, calling them swamps is not sexy. Calling them wetlands is what less swampy, but still pretty technical. Part of the problem on a lot of this topic is it's not a sexy topic. And the other part of the problem is a lot of the games are inherently a different version of unobservable. But the gains are latent. You know, the gains are things that you didn't gain a house, you failed to lose a house. And that's hard to make sexy, the failure to lose something, because it's invisible by nature. And so I think that's a challenge for marketing on all of these things. And I think that puts the onus on either the support system, the people on the outside who are trying to help, or people on the inside who care to try to do this, to get some measurable, observed things, ideally ones that are marketable. Anything that's observed to say, we made this big jump, we made this big difference. And, it, and if you can measure things that people care about, like their houses, or days of school we didn't lose, or something like that, I think you can, you can get, if it's more salient that way, but you need to be able to get that evidence to show we didn't lose it, we failed to lose that. Uh, as far as how much we need uh, of this, I don't think we know the answer. Uh, I think one thing we, I've seen in the data we collected is that there are some of these people we've talked to who are like, what we really need is to get the people out there, essentially to get my bosses to care. Because they don't, they don't listen to me, but they would listen if the voters said this is a priority. And so if we get more of the sort of people holding the feet to the fire from the people, and how, and how do you get them that engaged? Uh, in a lot of cases, when they get engaged when it's too late, Okay. Hello everyone, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to have lunch now, and then after lunch, in about uh, 30 minutes from now, we'll convene a short panel of all the presenters and some of the audience uh, members, and then uh, we're going to continue the conversation, okay? Please speak with Jenna is the one that's been making all of this happen. Hi, yes. my name is Xiao Lin. I come from China and uh, associate professor at the Tsinghua University in Beijing. And also, we have uh, we have a center of clinical pressing and research. And that later is the first social science center in China. And currently, I'm really empowered at the University of Kansas School and uh, until July. Hello everyone, my name is Connor Bruder and I'm an undergraduate student in Doctor City's Emergency Management and Homeland Security class. Yeah. Hi, my name is Bob Rashid. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral research assistant in uh, integrated coastal risk uh, of oh, National Center for Good uh, Integrated Coastal Risk. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, 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 I work for the extreme sea level and post of Hi, my name is Michael and I'm a PhD student at UCF. I work with Dr. Wall and my research focuses on storm surge modeling. Okay. Thank you. I am a new school of administration for the same time. Thomas Wall, um, UCF Sustainable Coastal Systems Cluster and Department of Civil Environment and Construction Engineering. Um, I'm an assistant professor here and my work focuses on sea level rise, storm surges, coastal flooding, um, impact and adaptation at local, regional, but also um, some, some global some global work. Hi everyone, Chris Emmerich, I'm an associate professor in the School of Public Administration and in the National Center for Integrated 
Coastal Research, and I'm a hazardous geographer. I'm Josh O'Connor. I work for Charlotte County uh, in the Southwest Florida area. Um, I'm the Footplant Coordinator and CRS Coordinator, uh, and I serve by Flood Plan Manager. I, um, I sit on the Board of Directors of the Florida Floodplain Managers Association. Uh, if anyone's interested uh, in joining, we do have student memberships. I talked to Connor about that earlier. Um, we'd love to have you join us and you know, talk some more about floods. I'm Claire Knox. I'm an associate professor in the School of Public Administration. I'm also an associate professor with the National Center for Integrated Coastal Research, and I run the Emergency Management and Homeland Security Academic Program. So I love seeing some of our students here. Thank you. My research is coastal hazards. I'm specifically interested uh, from a language-based uh, approach. So the fact that you guys are talking about how do you frame this, how do you talk about this, um, I use Habermas's critical theory to look at how language is used to legitimize some of our decisions regarding these issues. So um, I have lots of research on all that goodness, so I'm um, happy to talk to you guys further and see if some of the theories I've come up with would apply. Hey, good afternoon. I'm Joe Thalheimer. I'm one of the emergency manager practitioners here for UCF. So we have actually a team of five. Uh, Jeff Morgan, who has stepped out momentarily, uh, he's the director of emergency management, so I'm here to just take the opportunity to introduce him as well. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Catherine Valentine. I'm with the Seminole County Office of Emergency Management. Uh, for all of you who are not from Florida, Seminole County is just north of here, uh, so we're real close by. Uh, I'm a mitigation recovery coordinator, uh, so I deal with a lot of grants, mitigation, uh, CRS, all that stuff you guys have been talking about, but I'm relatively new to it, so uh, learning about it and seeing your perspectives has been great so far. Hi, my name is Victor. I am um, a PhD student. I'm from Spain. I am here to do my PhD with Dr. Walker and Thomas. And basically, uh, what we do is try to combine numerical and statistical models to um, improve the estimates, uh, which are relevant, the estimate of variables which are relevant for coastal factors. Victor? Hi, my name is Trini Gilman, and I'm the city planner with the city of Rockledge in Brevard County. I'm also the flood plain manager, and I have the privilege of working with Dr. Knox um, on our resilience uh, plan. Hello, my name is Janetta Maxena. I am an MPA student, and I am interested in the emergency management certificate here at UCF. I'm also a student of Dr. Siddi. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Now we'll go to the uh, panel. So any questions for the panel? Let's start. Okay, all right. Maybe a question for all of you, but I actually was planning to ask it after the Craig spoke, because that was about uncertainties, which is one thing I understand when I look at these maps or these tools from North Carolina, and they're great that they're very useful, and uncertainties may actually be counterproductive in terms of incentivizing action. But from a scientific perspective, it always hurts. You hear people talk about 500 year floods, and you ask, How do you know? And they say, Well, we have 10 years of data, we did an extreme value analysis. I get goosebumps when I hear that. Um, so, and even among scientists, this concept of uncertainties and how to assess them, it's tricky, but it's even trickier to communicate. So, I was wondering what your, your take on this is. Expect people are going to read it. They're not. 
And the reality is they're not. They're going to look at the map and hold the house and see what the dollar figure is. They're going to act on it. They're not going to go behind it and see all of the math and science that went into that, unless they're a researcher or a scholar. So how much information can we put out there? Now, another way to treat it, though, is not, and I know I've got some colleagues that are actually looking into this right now. I can't say much more about it. But one of the approaches that's being considered in some of these systems is let's not put a single number out there. Let's actually put a range of numbers out there so that you're looking at, you've got a range of possible outcomes that could occur for this structure. And we know with some degree of confidence that if you're here, you're going to see losses somewhere between X and Y potentially. The idea is to incentivize action, not to give the exact losses, because there are too many different things that go into it. I, I would, I'll give you a simple example. The hazards model that I uh, teach frequently relies on a point location to estimate a loss. Well, depending on where that point is, you will get different numbers. If it's a house on the hillside, if that point is at the bottom of the house, you're going to get a completely different number than you will at the top of the house. If you've got a 100,000 square foot industrial facility, the flood may not even touch the point, implying there's no risk. And yet, the model will generate a precise appearing number. So this is the reason that I, I said there's a real strong need to think very carefully about not, not communicating risk in an empirical fashion. Because I think when people see a dollar sign, it's important. But I think we need to think very carefully about how we communicate that. And it's not a simple question. I generally, when I'm, the report I'm doing right now, I've got rounded numbers, but I'm not going to put them out in the report. I'm actually going to round it off and there's $5,000 or $10,000 number. Because again, the idea is not to say $1,532 of damage, it's to say, you got a problem. You need to act on the issue. Um, the other thing, and Doug, you and I were talking about this a little bit, and kind of want to bring this back up, this whole question of just how much information do we put out there? So North Carolina has a dot on the map that says, you're going to get this amount of economic loss. And there's this concern that some have expressed, not specifically about North Carolina, but that approach in general, that you know, you're putting a dot on a house, and that's going to potentially have an economic effect on that house. My response to that in part is, folks, ever since we put an air photo underneath the map, that existed. But have we actually gone and made the risk higher for that person's economic value, or have we improved it? Because when I look at a map, which simply has a boundary on it, showing whether a building is inside or outside the boundary. If you're inside the boundary, does that mean you're at risk from that flood? That's not a rhetorical question. How many think that because you're inside of a boundary on a flood map, that means you're at risk from the flood? Not necessarily. If that house has been elevated, if it's been mitigated, you may be designed to sustain the risk. So when you are actually putting a credible, that's a big word, a credible estimate of impact based on the conditions of that structure, based on the actions that that owner's taken, you might actually be doing them a greater favor than you would by simply drawing a boundary and putting a photo underneath it. Yes, sir. Uh, Doug, you
the hospitals on the other, the county is cut in half for every single emergency. They have to duplicate all of those services and hospitals and whatnot. So is that an acceptable? So, so those are the kinds of things I think that have to have to think about. Thank you. All right. So first off, before I forget, thank you all for coming and for all your great questions and all of this, especially with the practitioners. I, I love this stuff. So I genuinely want to say thanks. It's great for me to hear. Very much appreciate it. Well, this question, uh, my slightly different take on this is, uh, I think it's an interesting challenge about dealing with uncertainty because we have all sorts of sources of uncertainty in these things. We have estimate, which is the simple estimation of uncertainties we might have, or measurement of uncertainties. We say the house is worth one hundred sixty thousand dollars. They, we don't actually know that. None of them, like the value, even measurement error thrown in with modeling uncertainty, thrown in with other forms of estimation uncertainty. And then we start going, well, that's just based on the hydrological models. Let's interact with the economic models that also come with their own attendant. And then our understanding to how those errors and uncertainties correlate, you know, being able to actually characterize uncertainty, is depressingly, fundamentally limited. And that's just our ability to characterize something, but we're not even sure we should be characterizing at all, because the point estimate is just easier. And we have a real challenge with that. And I, I don't have the, the easy answer. I think it's an interesting question when we start appreciating how sort of weaponized this information can be and how impactful it can be on behavior. And that would switch from being a reporting of information to actually trying to manipulate behavior through strategic provision of information. And doing that puts us in a really interesting position in the science on understanding how people understand whether it's three points in a point estimate, you know, a, a high, middle, and low, do they like to see confidence intervals? There's emerging science in this that we still are learning really cool stuff about the psychology of how people understand uncertainties and how we should best package it in order to essentially manipulate their behavior. And I don't know if enough people are expert in that who also would be expert in generating the uncertainty estimates in the first place. And how many staffs could be staffed by people who are expert in all of these things in order to make those intelligent decisions? I think it's way, we're nowhere near that in most cases. And I think that's a really interesting challenge. And I want to then, having said that, pivot to what I think is the more interesting policy and practical challenge to this, which is not about, well, is, so we had this example earlier today about giving, and just now, you know, giving information about the flood risk attendant to the property and how that can impact welfare, uh, well-being of different people. I think we're, we need to be really aware and sensitive to a world where the, the Joe Public idiots out there look to government to provide them with truth. And whatever that truth is, when you change it, and how much truth you say is in the truth, it might be that they give a lot more credence to that than you would actually say they can or should, no matter what disclaimers you put underneath that, no matter what confidence intervals, they will take that as law. And when you manipulate that, they're just that, that level of trust is really interesting because you haven't changed reality, you just changed their reality. And I think that's a different case than appreciating the uncertainties around the estimates is what kind of essentially liability do the information providers have for providing that information? Because it's not that the risk has changed, except that they in practice it has by changing the information that's attached to it. So I think these are really big questions. And if you just add more uncertainty to a number, A, that might not matter, because the consumer the number will just take the point estimate. Okay. And then B, you haven't changed the risk. You've just changed the information about it, but that might functionally be one and the same, which puts a lot of liability for value creation on the agency in a scary way, I would think. Okay, thank you. Questions? Yeah. Any questions? Okay. I have a question. Uh, got uh, for anybody else out there, those practitioners, um, I had thrown out the notion of machine learning and the recent advances in AI, which I recommend to someone just do machine learning, but I really don't understand it. Um, so, um, you know, we t you talked about GIS and some of the you know the trend analysis. I'm wondering. How, your just perspectives on how machine learning and these advances 
might help reduce communication issues or might help with the different paths of The potential is awesome, and I'm going to dovetail off what Doug said as well. The risk is great as well. There's a limitation to what you can do with machine learning. That machine learning is dependent upon the data that's being, right? So, yes, you can generate information extraordinarily rapidly. The National Water Center, how many of you are familiar with that? You know, it's doing some really interesting work. We're based out of Tuscaloosa, Alabama. It's a consortium of uh, federal agencies and other and others. But among other things, you use machine learning to generate your, I don't want to say your real time, but very, very rapid estimations of street flow throughout the entire United States. It's astonishing how amazing some of that stuff is. But it doesn't answer every question, right? It's giving you, it's based on a whole lot of assumptions. And this is sort of what we were talking about as well. You have to, and again, it's the communication. Because if you don't stop and ask what the methodology is behind the data, what the intended audience is, and what the questions are that it's supposed to be driving, then you can absolutely make incorrect decisions. And it can be weaponized, as you said. Now, that said, I think it's something that we can, should, and are leveraging. That project that I mentioned with um, Oak Ridge National Labs, it is a machine learning oriented project. Teach the technology to identify using imagery what a building is. Train the data. And all of a sudden, we've got hundreds of millions or tens of millions of building footprints. That is a very expensive process if you're doing that in accounting. Land vector compilation is crazy time consuming and expensive. And yet, we've automated that process. There are some things that I think are well suited to be developed from machine learning. Let me use, for example, is a good example. There are some things that we're going to have to think about. This is a great opportunity for research. The whole social side of the equation requires a lot of data inputs. And there's going to be a line between what assumptions we have to make that machine learning is driving and leveraging and what assumptions are informed based on actual data. So, you know, in response to your question, I think the potential is absolutely huge. I think that is one area that we are going to continue to see significant growth in. This is one of the reasons I think that what North Carolina has done for many states was just fractal and practical very few years ago. But I think within a short period of time, we're going to see that kind of information become more and more available. IR is pretty commonly available now. It's a critical input to generating a lot of the information that's needed. Imagery is very commonly available now. You know, you can get national data sets, and there's a lot of state level data sets that are being flown. Building footprints, again, same concept. Populating those building footprints with attribution and making it a publicly consumable data set. There's commercial data sets. Core Logic is a case in point, has a good one, or a decent one. But it's commercial, right? So a typical computer's not going to use it without paying some money. Could we generate some of those attributes from machine learning? Yeah, I mean, there's research underway to look at that. So, yeah. I, I, the quick answer to your question is yes, it's cool. How it's applied, I think, is the bottom of a lot of good research that's underway right now in our center. And, and I suspect uh, you guys are probably doing machine learning at um, this university as well. Yeah. What areas are you studying? I'm curious. I'll throw it back at you. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I know in the computer engineering department, they are doing stuff. I worked with one scholar, uh, Gina, Gina Sukukar, who we looked at. Uh, Applying machine learning to analyze tweets after Superstorm Sandy to see sentiments regarding climate change, and so we had that published. So it's it's still we we had issues with the methodology though of getting it to um, apply sentiment correctly, um, and so we had a group of coders. So we actually did it both uh, to see how it came out. Our coders were better. So the exciting parts of view of machine learning, with AI technology, the whole gamut. All, all the great technologies that have evolved over the last few years is up until now, basically, these massive piles of data, and I alluded to this is one of the things that's coming from disasters more commonly now than ever before, all this information is being collected, but you have that technology that can analyze that quantity of information. And I gotta tell you, if you sit down at ArcGIS of two or three years ago and try to do that, good luck to you. I mean, it's gonna crash the software. So these kinds of technologies today can handle these vast quantities of information and come up with meaningful conclusions. So we're not sitting there watching the answer spin the wheel. We're actually finding things out that we can act on. That's the value. I 
<clears throat> I'm a bit grumpier about it than that. Uh, I think what, what I've seen, generally, what I've seen in the last 20 or 30 years of doing this is an incredible rise in the amount of data we have. The, the truly exponential growth in data and data availability is, is awesome. And I have not seen anything close to commensurate in terms of growth in our terms of our models and be able to understand human and human environmental interaction. It's, we, we're not growing that fast in terms of how we can understand this, these phenomena. We can measure the heck out of them much better than before, but our ability to process that information is not growing. The technology we have for computers can literally process data and run algorithms, but our essential algorithm models for how these things interact and work haven't grown that fast. They're growing. They're not getting worse. We have better information and better data to inform them. But as exciting, I think the limiting factor is not as much data now as it is our models to actually integrate and understand it. That said, I just gave this bit about how we got new data and we don't have enough data on the context and decision processes and things. So often what we have data on are things that aren't necessarily the most important item. And that's where I actually really like the question about uncertainty, because we'll do these models and the sources of uncertainty might not be the things that we have a ton of data on. The sources, the biggest sources of uncertainty might be things like the human element and the quirky behavior of, of firms or households. And modeling that, understanding that, could be orders of magnitude more important than which, which square meter got how much water. Anyway, the, the data are cool though. Yeah, I agree. But let me tell you, the important part is the research that needs to identify the models that understands what the technology is and how to leverage that technology effectively. The, another thing that came up in that study that they did for FEMA last October, um, I interviewed a number of academics, and one of the points of complaint uh, from them was there's lots of data being created, but that data often isn't shared among academics. That is intellectual property, and there's disincentive for that to occur. So while we have all this terrific information out there, are we fully leveraging that? The academic environment doesn't necessarily reward that process. So until we think about doing that, we're really fully able to take this advantage of all these advancements of technology and the data. So we create our own models of that. Any other questions for now? Yes, a uh, question from me. <laughs> So earlier, uh, Shana was, uh, during Shana's presentation, she talked about sort of this situation whereby you have a, a, um, a community downstream, kind of paying a community that is upstream, kind of in terms of flood and kind of able to share the cost of reducing flood impact. So how do we begin this conversation? Uh, we know that uh, it's from the binary uh, analysis a result that we did. The uh, interview that is still currently ongoing. One thing that I notice in terms of the reasons for not participating in the CRS is lack of resources. You know, so how do we begin this conversation? How can we get communities to kind of come to the table and see, you know, the benefit of sort of sharing the cost? So that I mean, doesn't have to be you; it could be anybody, it could be anybody in the audience. Anybody? As someone that works in County, uh, in Massachusetts. Yeah, we'll do. I apologize, I've got to admit I'm not right now, so hopefully that doesn't make it too bad. Um, but the Archibald County in you know, Cape Cod, Massachusetts, um, they have one CRS coordinator that's coordinating with, not doing all of the work, but coordinating with 14 individual communities. And I think they've had success in getting four or five communities in, there's a couple more that are in the works. So that's, that's a great idea that you know, we, we haven't seen replicated much. Uh, I do believe there's, uh, a parish or two in, in Louisiana that is trying to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Okay. Thank you. Other yeah. insights, questions? Okay. He, he may have an insightful question. I just want to know something to earlier. More, it's more, more, okay, insights, additional insights, and what? Uh, so, one of the things that uh, at least I'm interested in, it's really the, the social equity side of coastal resilience. And uh, a project that I worked on last summer 
was going to be coming in on a uh, a flood zone area in Virginia that was predominantly comprised of uh, African Americans. And to me, what I found that was really interesting is that when researchers or practitioners don't reflect uh, the community that they're trying to serve or try to understand, uh, they're less apt to share information, information that make you rich, right? And so we realized there was a really big communication gap between uh, the floodplain managers and the community, and they were at least something that I'm trying to do now is trying to bridge that gap, right? And so trying to figure out uh, if we want communities to participate, how do they receive information? And the information that, it's not that they weren't interested in information, it was one that I like, trust, one thing you were talking about, and two, um, lack of resources, and then three, they just, just didn't know where to go find stuff. I mean, and it's more so, one of the things I propose is that having a, uh, a liaison, someone that was really interested in being on the ground because I spent maybe 30 days in the hot, hot, hot sun going door to door, which was the work that no one really wants to do, but the impact of it is something that I think creates kind of the foundation of how you uh, communicate those types of uh, concerns and bridge those gaps. So if you want participation, it's also trying to figure out you know, that one size doesn't fit all and where can you fill in those gaps? And so it was a really good project. So I think participation, it can't be just the wealthy communities. And people actually are interested in stuff, just don't want to talk. Well, there is a lot of communication efforts to try to bridge those gaps. Thank you. All right. And then I'll go back to you. <laughs> Sorry. And Dante, your comments actually uh, remind me of a couple of things. Uh, there is a program that is going on, has been going on in Louisiana called LA Safe, Louisiana Safe. Um, with that was actually both supported by money from the um, DRC competition. And what was interesting, what they had to do, well, first of all, Louisiana um, communities could easily be, um, and individuals feeling fatigued from all of the different kinds of meetings and public meetings and you know, discussions. And so that's something they put people to. But well, one of the interesting things that LSA did is they really organized their meetings around um, getting people to them, all of the people that had a stake in the issues, um, and went so far as to you know, have meetings during the day and at night, and having childcare at the facility, you know, with someone there to watch um, children and have something constructive to do, um, transportation to the meetings, because if you don't start to address those issues, you are coming out a chunk of the population. Um, and so I just thought that was a really impressive effort to, to really make sure that every voice was heard. Um, something that led you in on some of our strategic thinking and environmental defense fund, but we have a group called Climate Corps right now. We take uh, students uh, just finishing college, sometimes graduate programs, and we train them and we uh, set them up with institutions, typically a company, to help that company identify how it could reduce its greenhouse gas emissions uh, and, and what money they can save you know, in energy wise and whatnot. So, and it's been wildly successful. It's been around for, I want to say, seven, maybe ten years. So now we're thinking it's easy, a good deal, don't get in trouble, don't tweet on this. Okay? Um, we're thinking about, well, what if we a resilience corps where we could you know, train people to go out into communities and start to communicate some of this information, the risk, how to interpret these maps, what does this say, what does it not say. Um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts of does this make any sense to you? Would this be a resource that might be helpful? Um, I think we're almost out of time. So I'm just going to let it Okay, and then we wrap it up. And please, oh, sorry. Please, I'd like us to take a picture before we leave. Is okay? Please, yeah. Thank you. Wish we had more time because demographic issues are a huge problem. I think that especially older cities and even our city we're having an issue with because usually the lower income areas are usually in the most impacted areas that could be of an impact. 
and the, the economy is not there to bring them up. But um, one point I wanted to part put when you were doing your presentation was about being more proactive in uh, mitigation and things like that. I know in our end, which we want is our grant person over here that does our flood hazard mitigation that's shared between agencies for federal money. And it's always a battle of who's the bigger beast with the most needs that had the biggest social impact by a social media. Usually it's the biggest you know, news story that gets a majority of the grant funding. The problem I always see, and this is throughout all of them, not just flood hazard mitigation or anything like that, is we're, we're good for life and safety. All right, that's after disaster response. We've got to have money there to go in and protect life, and that's with anything we do. To the preemptive stuff, we can't really say, hey, if we do this area right here, it's going to save everyone, because we know there's a storm coming. Uh, it's going to come where it's impacted, we don't know. Um, trying to show that, I don't know if we got to look at property valuation, not government side, but more on the appraisal side, where they start valuating property for risk. And they decrease more uh, properties that are of you know, greater risk negatively. Uh, I, but I think it's a whole group of things outside of government that's really going to take it to move that situation. But it's one we try to be mindful of, but with you know, politics, it's, you can't direct funding, especially when infrastructure is aging, roads are crippling. You know, they know today I have a pothole that's going to keep me from getting my work. It may flood next year, it may flood in 10 years. You know, and it's not till that needs there that they really think, oh, we got to do something about this. Now, she has a small pot to work with for the city of Orlando, and she tries to direct it through flood studies and trying to keep up with it. Um, but it, it's a moving target for her. And it's whoever's district is controlling this that you really get moved on. And so it's, it's a fighting battle that you know, she's fighting. So I know it's going to be a big issue. Right. Um, I'm sorry that we're, we're out of time. I know there's a lot to be discussed. Uh, but before we go, uh, we have two more items. Um, I'm going to allow Dante Hansel. He's representing the Bill Anderson Fund, which is sort of incorporated as part of the grant. So I'd just like him to say one or two words. And then uh, we'll have uh, my director, Dr. Mayim Capuchu, to kind of give us the uh, closing remarks. Thank you. Okay, so very quickly, uh, so I'm a fellow with the Do Against the Fund, and the Do Against the Fund is a fund that supports uh, PhD students from underrepresented or marginally, historically marginalized populations that are studying uh, natural hazards and disasters. So, uh, Bill Anderson was a sociologist by trade, and I think some of you may know him. Uh, he was a very big uh, advocate in the natural hazards community. Uh, after his passing, his wife uh, created a fund in his, in his uh, memory. Uh, to support uh, some of us that are looking to do research and practice uh, at the doctoral level uh, and on. So uh, I, would, I have the pleasure of uh, being participating as a fellow. Uh, Dr. Sadiq sent the opportunity to us and I was selected for a travel grant to, to come here today so I was really excited about that. Uh, if you all are ever interested in participating in our webinars, we're always looking for panelists, experts, because we're always looking to uh, increase our exposure and knowledge about the field. So, if you want to know more, uh, I'll be here for a little while. So, thank you. All right, now I'll call the uh, director of the School of Public Administration, Naeem. He's been very supportive, so we really appreciate your support. Thank you, Dr. Sadiq, and thank you, presenters and students, participants, practitioners from counties, UCF, UCs, and all county, I think we have other counties. And uh, special students and practitioners, they all, some of all they will try matching the university is also part of the conference tomorrow. I have an interesting story I'd like to share briefly before we take the pictures and close the uh, workshop today. We had something very similar in 2012. And another building at UCF, we turned a certain workshop on the Bayern and USDA on disaster resilience. And we had Dr. Sadiq as one of the participants, observer. Uh, he's organizing a workshop on the Biomedical Science Foundation at the same for us, and we very appreciate it. And again, thank you, Dr. Sadiq and other members of the School of Grant. 
and Jenna, your support for organizing this uh, excellent workshop. And I think that was a wonderful conversation between practitioners and scholars and academics. And we hope to see more products or policy level recommendations for this project and in other projects for other scholars and practitioners. I have somehow developed a research agenda personally. I came to UCL about 16 years ago from the University of Pittsburgh, and my dissertation was on 9 11 response operations. And when I came to UCF, I said, I'm not going to touch anything on the emergency management related to subject. <laughs> and not even more than a year after, we had those four hurricanes in less than 25 weeks, and I've been doing research on disasters, disaster resilience, and related subjects since, since then. I think this is a topic that needs every bit of research and practical conversation to make sure we can produce some knowledge and as well as uh, policy, practical level of knowledge about practitioners and scholars to make sure we build disasters of the communities locally and here as well as uh, other places in the world. But one thing you think about our program at UCM, we have a growing university of programs, undergraduate graduate, we have Dr. Max, who has he's been spreading the programs, we have very strong faculty, some of them the room today and faculty in each other similar research projects. They also talk about school of the administration. And we do have very big cooperation with practitioners. I think that makes us very strong at UCF and the programs within the School of Public Administration. And finally I'd like to go back and thank you Dr. Sabri, the other else students and uh, if you are staying uh, enjoy my study outside. If you're traveling safe travels back. Thank you.